Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 13, Episode 119. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Wednesday, Steelers Nation, our final podcast before Round 1 of the 2023 NFL Draft kicks off on Thursday night. So, Dave, speak now or forever hold your peace or at least hold that peace until Friday. So it's going to get real crazy real soon. Yeah, it is. It's a great day to be alive, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Just wh- where is the time gone? Uh, mm-hmm. Just uh, I remember uh, getting some of those uh, those sheets ready that we do in the back end there for uh, you know prepping people and 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 laying out you know the guys that are going to the Senior Bowl and and to the Shrine Bowl and trying to uh, have those sheets with as much info on them as we can get when would would you know, uh, pre off season measurables and links, links to things and all like that. It just, it seems like yesterday is putting those together and, uh, in the process, starting to learn a little bit about some of these players and all. <laughs> and, and here we are, uh, the, uh, you know, about to come up on the end product and, uh, on, uh, you know, come Monday, we'll be talking about obviously, uh, completely new draft class and, you know, things will start really moving really fast at this point. And, uh, man, we've got a lot, we've, we've had a lot of content up on the site, haven't we? You know, when, when it comes to the draft process and now we get to sit back and, and watch and see what actually happens in this, uh, I'm about mock draft out <laughs> at, at this point. So, uh, happy Wednesday. Yeah. Happy Wednesday. We'll talk about our final mock drafts, yours and mine in just a little bit. I do want to start, though, before we dive headfirst into the uh, final draft discussion. Uh, Some Steelers news coming in right after the podcast on Monday. Pittsburgh, we we had just been talking about it during the podcast. Miles Boykin coming back on a one year deal. And so good to get Boykin back into the fold. It's almost like Edmonds last year, a couple days before the draft, a guy comes back. And so I'm happy for that core special teamer claimed off a waiver from Baltimore last summer. You know, big height, weight, speed guy out of Notre Dame. Pittsburgh had interested him in 2019, ended up taking Deontay Johnson to replace Antonio Brown. But they've always had that eye on Boykin. Only two two receptions last year. But uh, again, a guy that was a really quality special teamer. And so it's good to have him back. Yeah, when you look at the list of players that we talked about, would probably the best chances to returning, even though once the Allen Robinson trade happened, it to, to me in my head, it kind of diminished the chances of maybe uh Boykin uh returning. But uh lo lo and behold, here he is. And it's a uh we already got the financial details on that as well, too. It's a you know, it's a one year minimum uh contract, no signing bonus. Uh, it's a veteran benefit deal. So he'll have a $940,000, uh, cap hit attached to that. Assuming he makes the roster, there's no guaranteed money involved. So, uh, you know, obviously from a special team standpoint, you like to see this guy back a great, uh, uh, great asset, especially when it comes to uh, gunner abilities and 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 probably jammer abilities and stuff like that. But you're you know this this resigning doesn't prevent you from still if there's you know if the Steelers have one or two wide receivers they might be looking at three four wide receivers in this draft that that they like. You would think that uh, you know they want somebody with some special teams ability. Uh, on top of it, if they do go, but it's not totally necessary. And you could probably map out some situations where this team carried an extra wide receiver this early, you know, this early in the off season where they could accommodate Boykin if, if that's what he was, you know? So, uh, there's absolutely nothing not to like about, uh, the Boykin re-signing. And I think a lot of, you know, at least from what I see in the comments and, and on Twitter, I, I think a lot of people are happy that he's back. And and at least for now, and they should be. Yeah, uh, I'm in that camp as well. So to me, right now, your top five wide receivers in that room are Deontay Johnson, Johnson, George Pickens, Allen Robinson, Calvin Austin, and Miles Boykin. 
typically this team carries five to six. So you could, you know, earmark maybe one open spot. I don't want to forget about Anthony Miller. Uh, I think Steeler fans might be, at least in my comment section on Twitter, overestimating him a bit. It feels like, you know, he's not Jerry Rice. He's Anthony Miller. He's barely right. played the last two seasons, but he's going to be in that mix. You know, we'll see if they draft. You can't uh, exclude that, but I think you trade for Robinson. You bring back Boykin, who's got a defined special teams role that'll be hard for a rookie to to nudge him. You know, I think we're looking at best a day three picket receiver and probably more likely seventh round or the undrafted camp to bring a couple of those guys in. I think you're, you know, relatively settled at the top. Of course, you don't know what you have in Calvin Austin, but, you know, you feel probably relatively confident if you're Pittsburgh that he's healthy and and will compete and give you something in 2023. Look, you know, and I I understand people, you know, uh, when it comes to Anthony Miller and all, and I thought looking back at last season, if you want to talk, talk about one guy that looked to be in prime shape, especially for his age, it was him. But unfortunately he had that shoulder injury and never, never got to, you know, never, never got to see him and all like that. And, and, and here's the thing, you know, uh, if they did draft a wide receiver and he didn't play special teams, he would at least have a little bit of an excuse, right? Uh, I'm a rookie draft pick uh, uh, kind, kind of aspect there. Uh, uh, unless you, he's obviously a late round guy, then there's no guarantees there. But uh, uh, when it comes to Anthony Miller and you look at the bottom end of that, that, that wide receiver depth chart, the fact that Anthony Miller really at this point in his career, and really, I, in, in, I don't think it was really much of a case with him throughout his career in his prime either, not much of a special teams asset, if any, uh, there. And that's one thing that's going to hurt him uh, when it comes to potential 53-man roster. He's got, to me, from where I sit right now, and this is even before the Steelers even, you know, draft, uh, he's got an uphill battle to make the 53-man roster. Yeah, I think he's outside looking in. Could he make it? Sure. One injury would obviously change the complexion of the whole room. But I think right now he's outside looking in. They go to the camp and we'll see what happens from there. Right. And same goes with Gunner, right? Yeah. Same with Gunner Olszewski. Now he's got you know, the potential return ability. You know, he might battle Calvin Austin in, in that respect. So with Steven Sims going to Houston, it kind of opens that door. You know, Gunner was obviously signed to be that return guy last year, lost his job and you know, they didn't really have a great role for him the rest of the way, just kind of the jitterbug slot receiver that would you know try to block, you know, run motion, carry the ball occasionally. But, you know, he's got to he's got to really make that impact on teams in the return game to stick this year. I agree. All right, Dave. So that is Miles Boykin uh, transitioning now to our mock drafts as we get ready on the uh, eve of the 2023 NFL draft. Do you want to do this where we kind of go your first round pick, my first round pick, and kind of talk through them that way? Yeah, but I there is a conversation because because of my first pick that I think uh, I, I want to explain kind of thoroughly sure. uh, my my view on why I think it could potentially play out with 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 that tackle dropping there. Okay, well let's let's dive right on on in, and yeah, we'll we'll go. You know, your pick, you explain it, then I'll go my pick and and and, and explain that. So, in your mock draft, your one and only mock draft, I like that. I, I like that you did one because you always say whenever you do two or, or more, that next to last one is always the, the the correct one. So, just doing one, I think, hopefully, will solve that problem for you uh, this year. But uh, at seventeen, explain your pick and, and the rationale. Yeah, uh, and. This this goes to several levels here. Uh, a, I, I'm just going to come out right at right now at this point and say it. I, they got three. They still only have three tackles under <laughs> under contract here uh, on the eve of the draft. No, we we could get off this podcast today and maybe they add uh, add, add to that room. But you have three tackles in Chiquamo Core for Dan Moore Jr. and LaRaven Clark. And I count LaRaven Clark as a half a tackle uh, <laughs> at, at, at this point here. And come to start a training camp, this team will have probably seven at a minimum, right? Uh, yeah, I would say at least six, usually maybe seven, but you do at least three lines of uh, three offensive line units. So first string, second string, third string. So that, that puts you at, at at least six. Right. And I think I look back at last year and I think it was seven was the number they opened up camp with, uh, okay. with, 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 with tackles there. So help me out with the math there. Uh, six minus three is, 
Well, let me take off my shoes. I think we're going three. All right. I mean, what I'm getting at here is that room is super light. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit shocked. It's this light at this point. Uh, at least I, you know, I thought another name or two would, would be added in there. Uh, sh- long story short, this team's got to add a tackle early in the draft. Right. And, and it's something we've known for, I think for a little while now, but I, I, I think this, this, at this point, it's a slam dunk aspect of this, that this team needs to add a, a draft pick in the, with their first two picks of this draft and it needs to be a tackle. And if it can be a tackle in the first round, it probably needs to be. And if it could be one of, you know, what I consider probably to be two of the top tackles in Paris Johnson Jr. or Broderick Jones, it needs to be that either via, uh, and I would have never thought, and that's why you got to be careful in talking in definitives throughout this process here as you go along. I, I never really thought I would have been to the point uh, where I am right now, where we're thinking that that you know the probability of this team trading up to actually get a tackle uh, could be something that that I, I really fathom happening, but I I, I think there is a, a a pretty decent chance of that happening uh, here. Uh, and if you did, as we've said several times now over the last couple of weeks, if they do move up in the first round of this draft, it does feel like it would be for a tackle. Uh, and I, I, Hey, I think you would agree with that. Right. Yeah. 100% wrote about that in April. I've had the mindset where I think if they do make a move in the first round, it would be to go up, not to go down. All right. Now people say, well, why didn't you predict a trade in your mock draft? Well, I don't do that. I, I just have never done that. Never liked doing that. It's too, it, it, it's a, it's a bit too messy within that. However, comma, uh, Broderick Jones out of Georgia. When you look at the, when you look at these tackles, and and this is why I told you at the top here, this might get a lo- a little winded here, but I think I need to kind of explain myself a little bit more here. Uh, I think there is a, and I don't know what percentage to put on it, but possibly 50-50. I, I think there's a chance a guy like Broderick Jones actually does fall to the Steelers at seventeen, and. Why do I think that was part of this? It's, it's my duty to go through the top uh, 16 teams and uh, to pick ahead of the Steelers and try to kind of look at their needs and, and, and be a little bit predictive in what I think they, they will do. How many teams in this top 16 can you really see taking a tackle uh, with their first round pick? Assuming the or and, and it's dangerous to do, assuming – the order stays the way it is right now. I mean, Car- Carolina is not taking a tackle at, at the top of the draft, right? Sure. They're taking Bryce Young. Houston's not taking a tackle. Right. Arizona. Now I know all this, there's, there's been all this talk the last couple of days about Arizona and, and Paris Johnson and, 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 and all like that. But you know, they've got DJ Humphreys under a pretty decent contract. He's their left tackle. They re-signed, uh, 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 Kelvin, uh, Kelvin Beecham. Beecham. Yeah. Uh, even though that's not an expensive deal, it just, it, it, to me, and, and I know there's been all the reports on this to me, it just sounds like a big giant smoke screen. Uh, I I'll be pretty shocked if Arizona takes a tackle with the first round pick Indianapolis. I think you know, they need a quarterback, don't they? You know, uh, among other things, Seattle, you look at the, the tackles they got under contract. I would be very, very shocked if Seattle took a, uh, 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 a tackle Detroit. They've got, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, pinning and, uh, uh, uh the Ohio state tackle Taylor. No, 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 no. They've got, uh, well, they got uh Pinay Su- Su- Sewell. Pinay, yeah. Pinay Sewell, uh, over there. Las Vegas, they've they've got uh, uh, Colton Miller and and uh, another is look 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 deep at their you know two starters and, and the money that they're making over there. Colton Miller is one of them. I forget who the other one is over there, but they seem to be pretty good shape at uh, at, at tackle. Where it'd be a surprise. Atlanta is in good shape at, at at both tackle spots overall. At least contractually, that would lead you to believe. They're not going to take a tackle. Mm-hmm. Would you disagree with it with, with, with my statement within there that within these top eight eight picks, if they stand as is, 
that it would be a bit surprising to see a tackle come off the board there. Yeah, uh, assuming no trades. Sure, I'm, I'm with you so far. All right, now where the first tackle obstacle comes in here, in my opinion, is the Bears. At, at nine. At nine. Um, right. I, I think, you know, if they don't go uh, Jalen Carter, uh, you know, uh, on defensive side of football, I think there's a prime, prime chance they could go tackle. Now, uh, what do they think of Peter Skronsky? You know, you local boy, uh, you know, you, you can make an argument that if they thought Peter Skronsky can play tackle, that that will be their guy, correct? That's possible, but I do have the feeling most teams will, will view Skronsky as a guard. Okay. Uh, regardless, there is a decent chance of a tackle, if even if you count Skronsky as being that, uh, 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 of coming off the board there at number nine, right? Yes. All right, Philadelphia is not going to take a tackle. Uh, yeah, I would assume so. I mean, they got Lane Johnson's older at right tackle, but obviously a Bayard at left tackle, and, and he's going to stay there. And both those guys are on a pretty decent contract. So I, I don't think a tackle is going there. Uh, yeah. tennis, Tennessee went out and made a move during the offseason to get a left tackle. Who did they go sign? Uh, hold on a minute. I'll tell you real quick. Obviously, uh, Lawan out, trying to think who they... Uh, oh, Dillard. Andre Dillard. Okay, gotcha. Right. Yeah, that was, that was a good contract. Right. And, and oh, where's my depth chart here real quick here uh, on the Titans here? But, I mean, long and, and look, I, I researched all this out last night uh, or, or prior to my mock. Uh, Nicholas Petit Fri, Fri, Friere uh, mm-hmm. is a right tackle over there, uh, and I, I think they like him. And on top of it uh, – if they were to go tackle here, I don't, you know, you're not going to move Andre Dillard, I don't think. So if they did take a tackle, they'd probably be looking for more of a right tackle unless they said, okay, we want a rookie to come in that's played left tackle in college and move to right tackle. Or if they want a true right tackle, who are they going to take? Darnell Wright. Darnell Wright, right? Yes. Okay. I and look, they've got a lot of issues <laughs> uh, in there. Long story short, I you would be surprised if they took a tackle, right? Yeah, overall, yes. All right, Houston again at at, at, at number twelve. Uh, this circles back to what they've got under contract. There's no way. I, I I just don't see Houston with either one of their picks taking a tackle. Uh, yeah. You you get to Green Bay at thirteen overall. And, and mind you, in our, in my head, I've got one tackle off the board right now, whoever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, Green Bay at 13. You've got the uh, veteran uh, David Bacchiardi uh, over there at left tackle. You're paying him a huge sum of money. You know, you know, yeah, but he's barely played like he's been hurt. He's he, the way he even spoke recently. He almost talked as if he was off the team. So I know he's got the contract, but this guy has been perpetually injured. OK, uh, let's let's look real quick at what the what the contract uh, uh, looks, looks like real quick there. Uh, okay. He has, uh, I mean, they, they've already leveraged him out. He's, he's got a minimal salary right now in 2023 because of the way they've had to do this thing. And you're looking at uh, 19, 19, you're looking at uh, 38 million, I think in, in dead money with him, 38, one. Yeah, I mean, they, they just created a bunch of cap space, I think, with some of the Aaron Rodgers stuff. I don't know all the details in terms of how that contract's getting done. Right, before. right. but 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 that aside, if you trade him or cut him, you're looking at $38 million in dead money. Not yeah, saying, not, they're not, not saying they're going to cut him. Right. He's 32. He's got terrible knees. He's played 12 games the last two years. I think tackle is a possible. I don't know if they're going to do it, but it's certainly on the on the table. Uh, it, it would be more of a... Uh, if you spent a first round draft pick on a tackle, it'd be a, a, a in waiting type situation, though, I would think. Until Bakhtiari is hurt again, you know, two games okay. in. But yeah, I think that one gets like could go either way. I don't. I will be surprised okay. they take a tackle. At least that's what that's my my, my thinking here. Uh, the next two picks, I think, are two teams that 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 are worth watching. New England, they most definitely could go tackle. And then the Jets, it depends on what they think of Makai Becton uh, over there. Uh, another guy that's been hurt. OK, yeah, the report uh, is the Jets like Broderick Jones a lot. And that's like the one team where you sit there and go, OK, that that might be the one that that snubs the Steelers or compels Pittsburgh to try to trade up. Right. Uh, so 
I, in my head, Alex, I have three teams that I think have a high probability of taking a tackle. Uh, what about uh, Washington at 16? I, I don't think that's going to happen. What do they have at left tackle right now? Uh, Charles Leno. Up. What's his, uh, is he under a, a decent contract? Uh, let me pull them up real quick here. As they say, they're good at quarterback. Uh, Leno and Andrew Wiley. Okay, they signed Wiley this offseason. Leno's deal runs through next year. Probably less likely. I think corner's more likely, but I'm not going to totally rule out uh, the commanders either. All right. Well, I did in my head. Basically, I mean, he's uh, Leno is uh, making 9.25 this year uh, and another 11 million uh, next year. Not not that they couldn't get out of the deal next year, but it, that to me that would be another situation that if they if they were to draft a kid. Maybe Darnell Wright ends up, you know, it'd be more right tackle associated. I could see, you know, mm -hmm. uh, within that. Uh, so anyway, I, I look, is it 100% slam dunk that, that a guy like, uh, Broderick Jones falls to 17? The answer is no, but I think there's more probability to that happening than what most people seem to think in the old, he won't be there. Argument. Sure. I'm with you. I think I think the odds of Jones being there in my head compared to where I was like two weeks ago has increased. I think there is a, a chance that he'll be there. Would you give it 50 50? I'd put it below just making up some numbers like 65 35, 35 percent chance that he will be there. OK, uh, that that's that that was the train of thought in my head uh, there. Now, within that, let 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 me. Uh, you know, again, say that I, I, I think there is a problem, you know, another probability factor here of the Steelers going up to get maybe somebody like Broderick Jones. And if you needed to do that, you know, obviously I, I think you'd have to get to sh at least Chicago spot to get the top tackle possibly in this draft that you wanted to have your had to have your choice of tackles. I think you'd have to go up to nine. You would agree? I could see Johnson going earlier, but I think baseline level, sure. If you want to have the best chance, then I think nine's the, the real starting point to have that discussion. All right. Uh, from there, I would think that maybe you would have to go up to 12 to Houston if one of Paris Johnson or Broderick Jones was still on the board. Potentially. I've also thought about New England at 14, get right in front of the Jets if sure. you could. Now the Jets are going to be hearing the same conversation. They're going to look to trade up, but no team trades as much as the Patriots. Belichick always loves to trade back. It only be three spots. May not even cost you 49 to do that. Probably pick 80 or something like that. So uh, that's another you know potential to, to think about is 14 with the Pats. Hey, here, here, here's the, the spots that I think that you could potentially see the Steelers trade to. And there's been a lot of smoke around the night. I just wonder about Chicago. They traded down for one already. They moved down eight spots there. They've mm. got a whole, I mean, they got a ton of draft picks within the first 100 and whatever, 103 or what, what, five picks in the first 103. Uh, are they going to move down another eight spots in this thing to, to pick up more draft? And I, you know, the, the counter argument to that would be, well, it gives them more to move around wherever they want. Uh, at any point in this draft and get players that they want. I, I get all that, but I mean, to go from one to nine to 17, I, I, I really struggle with that. But that said, I, I think nine, 12 to Houston, 14 to new England or 15 to the jets. I think those are the, 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 the places where you could, see the Steelers potential potentially move to get a tackle 15 to the Jets you think you could trade with the Jets even I'm, if I'm just saying needed? that I I, I it, what if they say we're fine with our tackles and we're fine moving sure. down to two spots yeah. you know because okay. it, it all depends on what they really think of Makai Beck does does Aaron Rodgers want a rookie uh a, a, a rookie tackle and this is another piece of the argument as well too when you look at these tackles Overall, in the starts that they made and all like that, Broderick Jones could slide a little bit because of that, because of him not having, you know, the starts in college. 
Yeah, the tackle class is pretty inexperienced. Paris Johnson, one-year starter, essentially. Broderick Jones, like one-and-a-quarter-year starter. So you're not drafting these guys based off of, of a long amount of tape. You're drafting them based off of upside and, and potential. Right. So, I mean, that, that, that's not, you know, does Aaron Rodgers want a guy that's uh, <laughs> an inexperienced rookie tackle coming in there at, at left tackle? I mean, I'm just, obviously, I'm creating scenarios that, 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 uh, that helped my argument. You know? Sure. Uh, we'll talk about Broderick Jones, the player. You know, let's assume for a second he is there. Why should he be the Steelers guy? What was your thought process there? Because I think, A, he could even, despite his inexperience uh, in game started at college, I think he's a guy that could instantly come in and give Dan Moore everything he wants. Uh, and he could potentially win that job, uh, and then you grow him for there. He is not. He's not a finished product yet. I think we both agree on that. I think he's got some technical aspects of his game uh, with the hand versus the feet movement that 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 need to get better within that. Uh, he's just a he is a young developing tackle still. Uh, I do like his ceiling though, and I don't think he's seen that ceiling yet. But from an athleticism standpoint, from a character standpoint, from from Obviously, from a measurable standpoint, he checks all the boxes except for the games started in college. Comes from obviously a great, you know, uh, system, you know, uh, uh, Power Five, SEC, championship pedigree type type school within that. Yeah, I'm with you 100. Really good athlete, upside, you know, working out in space. You know, could, I think he's got the potential to be a good run blocker. He's not quite there right now, but he does have the desire, the nasty, the finish. Pittsburgh likes the great length that. Pat Meyer, you know, once in his system um, for that first punch, for that first significant contact. So I think he checks the boxes. I'm with you. Um, this team has to add tackles. I don't think it has to be early in terms of just adding the, the people, but the tackles and really the only tackles they've looked at have been early round tackles, you know, first, right. second round type guys. And so there's no indication that they're looking at the third, fourth round type guy to maybe get later in the draft. So it feels like if they're going to make the, if they're going to make the move attack, it's going to be early or, you know, almost not at all. The only, the only thing that I wish and I went back, I got, I, I DVR it when it happened because I don't think you can get it online anymore. I went back and watched the whole Georgia pro day. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> now I did do it on this, on the slow kind of fast forward uh, feature there uh, where I could make sure I, I, I saw, I, I was looking for uh, Pat Meyer there. I was thinking, man, did I miss him in any way? And I couldn't find him there. Yeah, but he came in for a visit, so sure. I'm sure they had a had a good conversation then. Uh, but I mean, he looked he looked pretty pretty decent, and I watched the drills with him and all like that. And you know, they did bring him in for a visit, so I would not be shocked one way or the other if if they traded up to get Broderick Jones or if he fell to him. I, I think there is some level of plausibility to the fact that Broderick Jones could be the team's first round pick. So who were the final two or three names that, that the first round pick of your choosing came down to who, who kind of was competing with Jones for that 17 spot in your head? Really? It, uh, and, and the others I considered were Deontay Banks, Joey Porter, Jr. Darnell Wright, and Brian Brzee. Probably no surprise there. I think most people have got it narrowed down. If you were to pick, you know, four or five names that, that, that those guys would be in there. Uh, I'm, I'm buying all the Deontay Banks smoke. I'm buying it. Okay. So who, so Banks was like second place in your head. If you had, if you, if you, if I said, uh, Dave, you can't, if you pick told Jones. me, right. If you told me those tackles are gone, you know, uh, Banks would be the guy in my head. And let me okay. tell you why it's not right because I'm, I'm having this, I'm still struggling with the whole right tackle, left tackle thing. That's the only real reason there. I'm just I'm I'm really struggling with him on the right side versus the left side. And that, you know, that's that's my issue, not not anybody else's. Okay. Fair enough. Uh so for my pick at 17, I've had kind of the same back and forth as you. I went Darno Wright from Tennessee. And to me it came down to one of three names, Wright, Broderick Jones, and Deontay Banks. And I think with Jones, he could be there. I think the odds have increased for the reasons that you just laid out. I just don't think ultimately he will. I'm really worried about the Jets at 15 taking him. Now, Wright could be off the board, too. He's picked up steam. I, who knows what's going to happen, obviously. Brian Baldinger has him and swears by him, you know? Yeah, and top tackle in the class, I think Baldy said. So for me, you know, I mentioned this, I think, a little bit last time. 
and talking about the offensive line uh, class in the previous podcast, but 21 years old, 42 career starts. So this blend of youth that Pittsburgh likes at the top with a ton of experience. I know that, you know, his best tape last year was at right tackle and maybe he will be just a right tackle in the NFL, but that's still a very important position. They got to block TJ Watt. They got to block Max Crosby. Right tackles have to do a lot. They're not just run blockers. Um, and I think, you know, he's gotten better over time and he may, he may be able to play left tackle as he gets older and develops and maybe his left tackle tape wasn't, you know, just because he was incapable of playing left tackle, but maybe because he was like 19 years old in the SEC trying to play left tackle, that's a very hard thing to do. So I think he has potential to play left tackle. He fits the Pat Meyer system, heavy hands, great first punch. It's going to offer more in the run game. And obviously the interest there, uh, Pat Meyer being at the pro day and he at the pro day coming in for a visit. So all those reasons, you know, the system fit, the need for a tackle tells me that uh, I'm going to go with Darnell Wright. Look, I I I started and stopped this thing and threw out. Yeah, you probably did as well. Oh too. yeah, yep. uh, you know because you you start you start trying to create in your head what the perfect scenario is and oh well these blues co- because I mean how can you not have the conversation about Joey Porter Jr. potentially being the guy right? Sure. I mean, yeah, it's it's the it's the free space on the bingo card. If you wanted to make an easy dock connect, there's nothing easier than than him. And if Joey Porter Jr. ends up being the pick. We'll kick ourselves saying, well, we should have seen it, you know, Just like Kenny Pickett last year. Right. Yeah. We, 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 we should have seen it. Uh, uh, who, who, who was number who, 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 who were the final two? I don't know they if I ever had a final right. two. It was right. Jones and banks, I guess, I guess it was right. And banks just under the belief that Jones will not ultimately make it there. But I had the same calculation on Kenny Pickett last year. Um, I said I, I, I probably would have put him in my mock if I thought he would be there, and, and obviously he ended up falling. So we'll see. But Wright, Banks, and Jones were like the top three. All right. Uh, so if Roger, if, if none of those tackles make it down to the Steelers and they stay put at 17, people, people will say, oh, I told you he wouldn't, uh, Broderick Jones wouldn't be there. At least you know, you know my argument as, as to why I think there's a chance. Fair enough. So we're both going tackles. We're just going different tackles at that pick. All right. At 32, what do you have Pittsburgh doing at 32? Uh, probably and a lot of people probably say maybe it's, it's a tad early for him, but, uh, you know, I keep going back and looking at, 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 uh, this team in the trenches and what they've done this off season, uh, on the defensive line, uh, Armand Watts looks great on paper Fahoko for what he can do. Looks great on paper. They obviously resign. You know, we talked a little while ago about Ogan Joby and how that kind of clouds things because of the contract they gave him and all like that. To me though, they still, you know, what, what if Ogan Joby ends up not, not being what you want him to be, you know, uh, this team still needs some injected, youth on this defensive line they need they need a player that i that can play up and down the line and specifically at nose if they can get some snaps out of it and i just go you know, this was a guy that you identified right out of the shoot alex to, a, a, as a fit and you know slowly i think the, the further you get deeper into his tape and and all like that you can pick out the flaws and 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 take them from a guy that maybe we both thought originally as a first round guy down to a second round guy, but there's not a lot not to like when it comes to Keanu Benton out of, out of Wisconsin as being that guy that could come in right away, give you some snaps across the defensive line. You can play them on passing downs and sub packet situation. You can line them up as the nose early on at that and, and get some pass rushing ability out of them over there. 32, a little rich for him. Yeah, I, I get that argument there. But I mean, when you look at this defensive, when you look at this true defensive tackle class as a whole, and especially for those guys that are six, three and a half or bigger, that got some weight to them. It dwindles quick. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it really does dwindle quick. And when you look at him from a measurable standpoint, not the perfect six foot five, six foot six that the Steelers look for, but he's damn close to it. And and uh, I just think he would be a good fit. It kind of matches the and You know, we'll see how much input Andy Weidel has into this thing. Right. Uh, if any, or, or as much as what maybe people think, but the whole address the trenches. I think I've done that here with uh, with Broderick Jones and Keanu Benton. And look, even if you if you were to move out, if they move out of this 32 pick and go down handful of slots, 
even better. I think there's a chance that Benton could still be there for them uh, in doing so. You don't got to twist my arm to convince me about Keanu Benton. I'm sold. I, I love the pick there. I think 32 is 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 perfectly fine. If he's your guy, that's your guy. In terms of the, the body type, the frame, there are so few guys that, that have that look. I mean, 6'4 with length and, and size. And so you don't wait around on that guy because there's a scarcity about that body type that, as we just discussed Monday, is getting harder and harder and harder to find. So I think it's a great pick. It's been a guy I've talked about all you know, draft season long, right before the senior bowl, yeah. yeah. And he had a good performance down there, came in for a visit. I mean, dude just checks every box. He's tough. He's physical wrestling background, productive Wisconsin. They're going to love the defense, love the coaching. To me, this, this hits every, every, every right note uh, in Keanu Ben. Would you agree on a defensive tackle class? What I, what, what I said, when, you know, when you're looking for those inside guys that, you know, six foot three and a half or bigger, you know, 295 or more pounds. I mean, it, 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 it dwindles quick. Yeah. Uh, there's a scarcity and that's true every year. It's becoming more and more true as guys get smaller and, you know, become more pass rush focused and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, it, it's hard to find that body type. Now could, could, could Mazzy Smith be a, be an option there? I, uh, it's, sure. plaus- it's plausible. Yeah, it is. I think Benton, though, has, you know, I know that Mazzy's, you know, their book on him is kind of that Bruce Feldman freak athlete, but you saw more pass rush juice from Benton. I think you saw a better hand use. I think you saw somebody that is a little more athletic. I just, when you watch him on tape, a little more productive. And then Mazzy Smith has that off field concern with the, uh, the gun charge there. Uh, my others uh, that I put in there as consideration, <laughs> you can't you can't put the second round pick without Darnell Washington in there. I put Mazzy Smith as as a guy I considered. Uh, Will McDonald, uh, I, I I think there's a possibility of that. And then, you know, John Michael Schmitz. You know, if this team really is going to take a center, uh, that might be the spot to get him there. Yeah. Uh, you know, this team's had so much interest in that interior offensive line. So my pick at 32 is Tyreek Stevenson, the corner from Miami, Florida. Again, some people will think that's a little too high and and maybe it is, but you get out ahead of that cornerback run and like Taylor, for whatever it's worth said, this guy's going to go a lot higher than, than what people think. So it's a guy that literally models his game after Patrick Peterson. So how about go draft him and have Patrick Peterson mentor him. He's got speed. He's got size. He's physical. He plays the the quick game well. The three step game plays the five step game um, well. You know he's got some production. You know I think he's got to do a better job defending the deep ball. But you know overall he's the type of corner that Pittsburgh's looking for. I like him. You're not going to get an argument out of me. I just you know I I you know the argument for where you have him and where I have him will be well. Uh, it's 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 Alex has him. It's too rich where Alex has him but he won't be there where Dave has him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, right. So I, I have him. Uh, we, I think we both kind of had the same train of thought here. If they don't get a cornerback in the first round, they better think about get one real quick. Yeah. To me, corner is going to be one of their top two picks. If it's not at 17, it's going to be somebody at 32. That's, that's my train of mind right now. All right. Well, I have him slipping a little bit and, you know, down to, uh, down to 49 overall, but that ended up being my 40, you know, my second pick in the second round was uh, Tyreek Stevenson out of Miami for all, yeah. for all the reasons that you just mentioned. And I wonder too, if my Ike Taylor gets a little loose lipped, you know, uh, in there, you know, uh, look at me, you know, I'm a scout, you know, and this is what we're thinking kind of, kind of way. I, you have to put some stock into what I think Ike Taylor says at this point. And he was at that pro day. He did put, mm-hmm put Stevenson through his workout. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I don't Who else was there was, uh, at that Miami pro day? Who, who else did I of note? I think just Ike, maybe there was another scout, but it was really the focus was, was Ike right. Taylor being there. All right. So anyway, I, I think if they miss out on, you know, a Joey Porter jr, uh, Deontay banks, I think this is kind of the next best thing is just, where does he come off the board at? Yeah. And second round, third round, you're kind of looking positional coaches. I know that Ike Taylor is not a positional coach, but you know, he's kind of that specialized cornerback DB scout. And I think his work's going to carry some weight. And of course he came in for a visit and, you know, just checks those boxes. And he's got covered George Pickens early in his career at Georgia before he transferred to the U. So he's gone up against, you know, top dogs like that before. And so just makes all the sense to me with Tyreek Stevenson, but but it, you could put in a bunch of corners here. They've looked at all these sure. top corners, and certainly Stevenson is not the only name. It just to me the one that I ultimately chose. 
I mean, you could potentially what throw Brent's in that argument. I mean, there, yeah. there's there's quite a few in that second tier, right? Yeah, Keely Ringo is a name that I don't want to forget about either. I think this team's going to really like Keely Ringo. I probably like him a bit less than what the Steelers do, but I could see Ringo being the pick at 32 just as much as Stevenson. All right, I already have revealed my 49th overall. Uh, who was your 49th overall? Cody Mock, and the internet does not love it, and I'm going to keep putting in Cody Mock in there and, and see if I'm right or wrong about this thing, but I think they're going to love this guy's compete, his um, potential versatility to play all five spots. He was a tackle in college. He plays all five at the Senior Bowl. They're going to love that just kind of can-do attitude. They're going to love the – what's the uh, the joke on him? Toothless and ruthless is Cody Mock. This guy's a great run blocker, a mauler, tested off the charts. Um, you know, not going to be an NFL tackle long term, but he could play there in a pinch. You know, could you play him at center is the question I, I think I'm kind of wrestling with right now. And listen, I get it. This would this would not be my pick. This is a mock of what I think Pittsburgh will do. And I simply cannot ignore the fact that, you know, Pat Meyer was at five pro days this year. I can't ignore the fact this team brought in what five or six interior offensive linemen projected to go first round, early second round, including Cody Mock. And for them to bring in a small schooler from the FCS level. That does not happen often, and to me, that generally is going to signal a pretty high level of interest there. So, you know, how does it look? How does it fit? When does Mock see the field? I'm not quite sure, but this team's going to want extreme depth. They're going to want, um, you know, big maulers up front, and so I think to not put an interior guy based on all the interest there, it's kind of rolling the dice, um, just reading the tea leaves. So, you know, I, I think that that's why I want Cody Mock. All right, uh, you've heard me talk several times about, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd buy a ticket to a mission to see Darnell Washington, uh, you know, in, in a Steelers uniform and how they might use them and, and the impact it would have. Uh, put put Cody Mock in there for me as well. I mean, I, I love his tape. I, I, I really do. I, I just couldn't pull the trigger on him uh, myself. But, I mean, you go back to that senior ball and, and even the all-22 uh, uh, practice film on him and then you get into the game and how much he moved around on that line just flawlessly really mm-hmm. even at center I mean there's some great there, there's a few very good snaps with him at center in that senior bowl game you know yeah right uh, and I, so, so I mean you uh, and in other words I, I I can see your reasoning here yeah and, and he may profile easier at, at guard he may end up playing some guard but you know, he's a guy that may might be able to you know, back up all five spots out of the gate and one injury takes place and he may be seeing some time. But again, yeah, I'm looking at my numbers here. Yeah. Five guards or centers came in for uh, pre-draft visits. That's that's 17%. You throw in some of those tackles as well. I think his team wants that extreme level of, of great offensive line from that vital model. And so they're going to keep building this thing up to the extremes. All right. Num- all right. Uh, I, 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 I considered... Dexter, uh, Felix and Duque, Uzama, Matthew Bergeron. I think Matthew Bergeron's going to, uh, I think he might be a little bit underrated in this tackle class after going look deeper in his film, to be honest with you. I, I, yeah, I there's, there's really rumors think. he might go late, late first round. Who knows? Uh, and then uh, Derek Hall. I mean, uh, it's hard not to put Derek Hall. You just wonder, goes back to what you said, man, you just wish they would have shown more pre-draft interest, interest in him. All right, Dave, at pick 80, what do you got for the Steelers? Tuli Tui Pulato, edge out of USC. Uh, I think you have to look hard and long at the fact that Mark Sadowski, the team's director of player scouting, went all the way out there to USC to that pro day. I don't know. Maybe he drew the short straw or something for all we Mm. know. But, you know, they only had five players were at the scouting combine. This year, talking about USC, obviously, Jordan Addison uh, was one of them. Uh, Thule was one of them. Uh, uh, The running back. uh, Travis Dye. Travis Dye. And I forget who the other two were. Well, Voorhees. Wait, he didn't work out, obviously, with the ACL. Right. Voorhees. And and, Blackman in the corner. Right. So uh, that's a long way to go. to, you know, to look at at, at, at five guys, I, I think the they brought obviously brought Tuli in for a pre draft visit, so I think there's something there. Uh, I mean, very productive guy off the edge at USC, played on his feet, moved up and down in alignment uh, from from a rush standpoint as well too. I'd like to see about eight pounds come off of him, and I don't know if that's possible, but uh, outside of that, and obviously some of his 
I think some of his run defending needs needs improvement, but uh, he. He looked good at 266 or whatever he played at overall. Uh, he's got the NFL bloodline. His older brother, Marlon, was a defensive lineman at USC. And when 2021 six-round draft pick of the Eagles, uh, I think he's related to uh, uh, ha- uh, uh, Halifu- Halifungu over at the 49ers. Mm. I think he's got some other uh, uh, relatives in the NFL. You know, just uh, I, I think, and this team does need an edge, I think, in the middle rounds of this thing as well, too. So I went Thule out of USC. Yeah, that's one guy whose tape I was throwing on last night as a, as a last kind of revisit, and I was working on the pronunciation, so it's what? Tui Pelotu. Thule, Tui Pelotu. And I think it's a really interesting note on his brother because, of course, who was in Philadelphia in 2021? Andy Weidel. And so right. any little connection we can you know come across there. But yeah, the first the first play I put on of him last night He's lined up a nose tackle. I'm like, whoa, okay. I don't know if I expected uh, that necessarily. And so he's a guy that that you said did really play up and down the line, probably played a bit more interior um, than what he's going to do at the NFL level. My note on him is heavy hands, like a very strong punch, good leverage, and can drive some of these guys back. I think that first punch, he's got a good get off, um, is impressive. Again, it's a little bit of that. Where does he best fit? Is he really a natural edge? Is this, he's not He's not the Marvin Leal. He's certainly a, a much stronger, you know, heavier-handed type player, better run defender, but there is kind of that awkward, okay, exactly where does he fit? What system does he uh, best uh, be utilized for? And how does he fit in the Pittsburgh? Some questions there, but he's got length, he's got production, he's got some pretty heavy hands. I think he's flat out just an outside linebacker in a Steelers system. I, I don't think, I, I saw enough on him that it, that I'm convinced he can do that. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah, I think it's fair overall. This guy plays hard, plays to run hard, so that that would be his position. But just just saying that, you know, he was not like a full time edge at college. He was kind of being used all over the place. Right. And wasn't uh, wasn't Highsmith sort of moved around quite a bit? Yeah, well, Highsmith was at three four base end, like right. totally miscast, and then he stood up his senior year, had that big breakout season. So sure, I and mean, obviously the inter- the interest is there with the pre draft visit. So I'm not arguing that. I'm just kind of going through the tape and and looking at uh, you know because Keon White was kind of the same. Keon White was kind of moved around. I mean, he's a, he's a different body type, different style, but it's some of those guys that are trying to find their their exact home at the NFL level. All right, what do you have at eighty? I have at 80, Nick Herbig from Wisconsin. And again, some people might think this is a little too high. I think it's right about in range, third, fourth round on on, on Herbig there. That's a guy we've talked about for, for a while. Now, he's probably not big enough and long enough to play on the edge. He probably kicks softball linebacker. Um, he's physical. He's aggressive. Makes up for kind of that lack of size. That, that won't be as much of an issue inside. If he's an inside linebacker at 6'2", 240, that, that's perfectly um, you know, fine overall. He's been productive. Wisconsin guy, Aaron Curry at that pro day. I wrestled with this one quite a bit. Looking back, if I, if I had to make one change for my mock, I might have swapped out Herbig for Penn State safety, Jair Brown. But, you know, the connections are there. They love the the bloodlines, obviously, Nate Herbig being a Steeler. So, you know, I'm going with Nick Herbig. Yeah, I understand that, obviously, for, for, for the several dot connecting aspect with there. I just, this is a guy that I've struggled with as far as where does he go, you know, all, all it takes is one team to love him as an edge uh, and, and and go that route or one team that says, look, dude, this guy, we can instantly kick him off the ball uh, without issue. Go back to that uh, pro day uh, interview with him and him basically saying that he he's pretty sure he's going to have to move off the ball. That's what clouds it up the most for, for me. But within all that, too, uh, and, and you didn't mention is, this is a guy that you can instantly probably make a core special teamer on top of it while you figure out what 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 you're gonna do with him. Yeah, he's gonna be fantastic on teams. He, you know, good athlete overall, ran pretty well. And, you know, the inside linebackers, you know, you bring in Holcomb, who's gonna be here hopefully for at least two years. Roberts could be one and done. Tanner Muse is just special teams, so there's still, you know, potential for this guy to see some some sort of defensive role. Obviously, Mark Robinson is is gonna be in that mix as well, but um, just seeing Aaron Curry hit some of those mid round linebackers and Dorian Williams and Nick Herbig would signal that that potential mid round off ball linebacker pick. He's got some great edge rushing tape <laughs> for a first yeah. ball for an undersized kid. Yeah, and he's just super intense and and plays with a really hot motor. And Pittsburgh's gonna like all that kind of stuff. All right, all right. So at what twenty? What do you what do you got, Dave, uh, in the fourth round? Uh, guy, you know when when all these all, all these. Uh, uh, depot contributors came out to Las Vegas. We sat down at Stickies 
One of the first names I threw out to them that I'm really interested in learning a lot, a lot about was Ricky Stromberg, the center out of Arkansas uh, there. I think this might be one of the most underrated centers in this year's draft class. Uh, they obviously weren't at his, or, or at least uh, Pat Meyer did not go to the Arkansas Pro Day. That disappointed me. Uh, they did not bring him in for a pre-draft visit. Uh, the reasons behind all that, I don't know. Maybe they didn't need to because this guy's characters just thought uh, I really like his character. Obviously got a lot of tape there, uh, as the center at Arkansas, uh, checked the only box he didn't check was because he didn't do it. I don't think. And that was, that was the bench. I think, right. I believe so. I can check my, my notes, uh, um, 33 and a, a, a quarter inch arms. And when it comes to this center class, him and Juice Scruggs, at least for the rep, you know, the, the, the ranked ones overall, they, they, they tied for the longest arms in the center class here. Uh, six foot three, two eights, 306 pounds, uh, plenty of tape on this kid. And uh, uh, would be a, a, in the fourth round, a guy that, you know, you wouldn't be forced to 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 get into the starting lineup right away, but in the in the same breath, should be able to push a guy like Mason Cole and give you a guy that could potentially be your starting center. And you're right, Stromberg uh, only missed in the bench because he did not participate. I imagine if he got on there, even with longer arms, he probably would have checked that final box. Uh, he did play a little bit of guard in, in in his early days at Arkansas as well, too. He's got 11 games. Uh, starting at guard. Nine of those came at right guard with the other two coming at uh, 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 at left guard there. Started 44 games that total at Arkansas with 33 coming at center. Yeah, that's a really impressive resume overall. I think it's a great choice by you. I kind of like it's a little bit off the beaten trail because not every pick is going to be. We could, have, we could have a mock with just full of pre-draft visitors and just make it super, super easy. But it's fun to kind of pick some names that maybe aren't being talked about quite as much and maybe aren't uh, as obvious as some of the others. And I think Stromberg's a great candidate there. All right. What you have uh, at uh, uh, 120? Carl Brooks from Boiling Bowling Green, the defensive tackle. I've talked about how this team might be looking for more of a three-tech pass rusher now that they've added some of the you know base personnel, interior guys in Fahoko and Armin Watts. And obviously, there's connections here with Carl Dunbar being uh, at that Bowling Green Pro Day, putting Brooks to his workout specifically, and then Brooks coming in for a pre-draft visit. You know, one of those combine snubs. His team wanted to take a an extra long look at. You know, really good athlete. He's played on the edge, but he's you know he's got heavy hands. He's you know added weight. He's not he's not quite to Marvin Leal. You know, he's a bigger guy. He's a stronger guy overall. A bit more, I think, position to find. Super productive in Pittsburgh. They love their Mac guys, and so I'm going with Carl Brooks to be a rotational three-tech and sub-package from basically day one. Had I not taken uh, Benton where I took him and, and waited, uh, Carl Brooks would have been my selection here as well, too. I mean, we, we know the dot. We've talked quite a bit about him through this process and the dot connecting, and if they did have to wait uh, to, 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 to address the defensive lineman down to this spot, uh, that's, that's a, a super – Easy dot connection right there. All right, Dave, after the long wait from fourth round to seventh round that I believe Omar Khan will find a way to bridge. But until then, seventh round, 241 overall. Who you have? Who you got? Yeah, I went back to and I, I talked about him after the the uh, the Steelers went to that Iowa State Pro Day. Now, obviously, all of them did not show up to watch Anthony Johnson uh, <laughs> do do his thing out there. Uh, you had bigger names out there that you could go see, but a byproduct of that was Anthony Johnson Jr. out of Iowa State being there. Fascinating, fascinating guy. A guy that I'm, even if he does not end up being a Steeler, I'm going to be interested to watch what happens with him. Uh, the thing that's probably going to drop him down, and, and he is a hard guy to gauge because of it, played cornerback a lot at Iowa State, made the switch to safety this past season, handled it really, really well, I think. Overall, a guy that uh, even when he did play corner, played outside and played in the slot. So as a transitional guy, I think he could find a way to get on the field as some sort of maybe dime slot defender or something initially out of the box. I thought his safety tape overall was not bad. There is going to be a transitional element into the NFL of becoming a 
a a a you know more of a box safety than than probably anything in there. Uh, has the willingness to tackle. Just a, there's a lot of and uh, Terrell Austin was obviously out there at that pro day. He put Johnson through the uh, through his positional drill workouts, and then you know Johnson was real revealing. I think uh, after after that in his interview as well too, uh, when asked you know what did they what did uh, you know basically the students tell you they 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 envision you as and he 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 said you know as a safety as a slot defender and all like that. So uh, I don't know if he's going to for sure be on the board there. He's one of those guys that. You know, because of the position move, what are teams going to he'd be, a, to me, an excellent special teamer right out of the box as well, too. But uh, if this team uh, decided to wait late to address to address a, you know the safety position and one particularly that could probably play in the box, play, play, play in the slot and all like that, and assuming Johnson – a plus 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 character as well too. I mean, a guy I think that you want in the locker room there. I could see Anthony Johnson being a selection there. Was there anything about his character in particular that gave, that made you go with the A plus 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 mark? Is there something I, about his story that uh, I'm not aware of? Uh, just uh, just everything about him. You you dig deeper into this guy the way he talks. I, uh, Everything his his team first attitude is his 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 willingness to easily make that move from from corner to say just everything about him. Was he a captain by chance? I, th- I think know? he was. Yes. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, it's a guy that tries to fill both needs with a slot corner concern. That's a very real and and again, I'll I'll repeat the line there: underrated, kind of forgotten about need for this team. You know, pass down slot corner. No idea who that guy is going to be for Pittsburgh right now. And then some safety help as well. He's got size. Um, is this a little, is this a little Antoine Brooks like in terms of trying to get that bigger guy that can try to play both slot and safety? Sure. Hopefully better, obviously, yeah. but it seems to be maybe the, the overall idea. Uh, let's see. Voted as team captain for a second consecutive season last year. I think. Yeah, that'll do two time captain Pittsburgh loves those guys. All right. All right, my pick at 241, I'm going Lonnie Phelps, the edge from Kansas, kind of a guy I've consistently had floated in the back end of my mock drafts. He, he's got the same body type or same size as, as a Quincy Roche, so some people say he's a bit too small to play edge, and he does not have ideal size, but we're talking seventh round here, and he's got you know some length that's not terrible overall. He's a transfer like Roche was, but, but I think he's a meaner player, more physical, more intense guy that is just a dude on special teams. At the least, you're going to get like a core type guy there. He's productive. He transferred and still had production last year. 11 and a half tackles for loss, seven sacks last season. And so that's a guy that, um, you know, should be, I think, on Pittsburgh's radar. And for whatever it's worth, I know it might not be much, but um, Lonnie Phelps was at the Senior Bowl and on the national team where Grady Brown, the Steelers DB coach, was the defensive coordinator there. And obviously, right. Grady Brown coaches DBs and Phelps is an edge, but you still get to know that guy. A little bit more and I think that's going to be maybe a connection one thing to look at maybe some of these Steelers defensive draft picks will end up being some of those senior bowl guys that Grady Brown really got to know right how many times do we remind everybody early in the pre-draft process pay attention to the senior bowl and the shrine bowl list right right and especially this year because they actually had a coach there because the way they're doing the senior bowl did not have you know the Steelers coaching staff and the Bill's coaching staff. It was individual coaches. And so you had Brown as the DC. Although I thought Tyreek Stevenson and Julius Brunson, those were on the other team. I thought those guys were on Grady Brown's team. They weren't. And so um there's names like Riley Moss that were on, you know, Grady Brown's national team that you want to consider a bit more. But that's that's a hidden connection that I think people have to think about. All right. I understand it. All right, your final pick here, Dave, two fifty one, and I'm, I'm I'm loving this one. I'm all, this is like my favorite pick of the entire. It's like Benton and and this guy just home run, Dave. Good job. Look, you know me and tight ends, right? Uh, mm-hmm. You're probably surprised that this uh, mock draft did not include uh, uh, Darnell Washington, five five edge rushers, uh, uh, and, and, and a pulling guard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that- that's that's what his name would be. Just you know, <laughs> round five. Pulling guard, right? Pulling guard uh, university. Yeah. Look, uh, I I've talked about this several times. And he, even since Zach Gentry was resigned, I, you, you're not married to him. Uh, they've, they've got, they've got, in my opinion, to get some competition in there as the number two tight end as someone that can block. And we've talked about the list uh, a couple of times throughout this, 
you know, and you've talked quite a bit about Noah Gindorf out of North Dakota State. Uh, big body guy, six foot six, 263 pounds. Unfortunately, did not play a lot this past season because of, uh, I think, an ankle injury that ended up needing surgery there. But if you go back and you look at the tape from the, you know, last, last couple seasons he was healthy and played, uh, I mean, it, it's FCS level, and I know that is what it is, but you're not going to find a better blocking tight end, I don't think, uh, with within this. Uh, and I, uh, this is important as well, too. As deep as this tight end class is, only 20, uh, 20 tight ends, I think, were, were invited to the combine this year, and they, they knew about his situation with his ankle before mm-hmm. that. Uh, and uh, he was one of 20 tight ends at the combine, and that means something. All right. Uh, to me, he only caught 44 passes in college, but let the record show that 12 of those were, were for, for touchdowns. He's a big throwback inline tight end who can block and uh, you could do worse than 251 overall of taking a guy that could compete and push Zach Gentry on this roster. I'm with you, Dave. I love it. And Pittsburgh, you know, I know Andy White all this organization, they're going to love mental toughness, guys who are tough, embody what Pittsburgh wants and needs to be. And with Gindorf, you know, he broke his ankle last year, gets surgery, tries to rehab it, doesn't feel right the, in the summer. He guts it out, you know, after like the first game, he tells uh, the, the doctors, hey, my ankle's still just, you know, it's, it's in a ton of pain. They do another MRI. They say, yeah, you need an- another surgery. And he says, well, you know, can I still play against Arizona? I want to play against Arizona. Doctors clear him. He plays. They almost beat Arizona. They still lost. But uh, Gindorf played, caught a couple passes, you know, contributed well. Then he gets the surgery. He's out for the season. So for a dude to sit there and say, forget about the draft and forget about my future and, you know, getting the surgery done as soon as possible. I want to go out there and play. I love that about this dude. It's a really good blocker. And this guy can catch too. He's got good hands, yeah. soft hands, combat catcher. It's hard to find the receptions. You got to go really back to 2019 when Trey Lance was there. You get some more of the downfield action, the vertical action on Gindor. But this guy's got a solid pair of hands. And this dude, I'm with you, is maybe the best blocking tight end in this class. The issue, of course, is that ankle. Right. I don't believe Pittsburgh was at the private workout that Gindorf had. Nine scouts showed up. I don't believe Pittsburgh was one of them, which gives me pause. Um, but obviously, they could still have interest in the guy. And if he's healthy, this guy's going to be a number two, number three tight end for a long, long time. Look at us, Alex. Both of us have a North Dakota State. I know. <laughs> That, that really is a new era. I think under <laughs> Kevin Colbert, I don't know if he would quite uh, be as uh, throwing around the FCS guys. All right, take us home. At 251 for me, Chamari Connor, the defensive back from Virginia Tech. Basically, my Anthony Johnson is, is how I'm approaching this. A guy that can play slot corner, a guy that can play safety, heavy hitter. I thought Josh Carney did a good job on the scouting report on him. Um, the production kind of waned a bit later in his Hokies career. There's better production, better numbers earlier in it, but tested really well. 9.16 uh, RAS figure and a guy that's just a quality dude that's intense, that brings energy and a great special teamer over 800 career special team snaps. Four times he wore. I was, I was going through his tape and I, I was like, why is this guy changing jersey numbers in every single game that I see him? Like he wore number one. He wore, I think, 23. He's wearing 25. Number 25 is retired by Virginia Tech for Frank Beamer. It's only given back out to guys that are like top end special teams players on a game by game basis or something to that effect. And Connor wore it four times throughout his career, which is like tied for a school record. And so he's a really high end special teams guy. Great gunner, some really good tape there. So he's going to be, you know, a guy that can help you out in a lot of ways, safety slot corner and on teams. And so um, I think Connor may go higher than this, to be honest, because he's got good tape, good production, but, um, and Sheldon White at that pro day. And you talked about how USC didn't have a lot of draftable guys. Virginia Tech has like no draftable guys. And for Sheldon White, who's not just an area scout, a higher ranking member of this front office to go to Virginia Tech tells me something. And so I, I got to go with uh, Chamari Connor. All right. Nice. Nice research there. And I'll throw in a couple of my undrafted names that I think may fit just at random here. Uh, maybe Max Duggan from TCU. I like Grant Gibson from NC State. Uh, Scott Matlock from Boise State. I think he gets drafted, but like that's a perfect Steeler pick in terms of a 4i, 5-tech. Uh, Trustin Ford from Montana. Nick Anderson from, from Tulane. So 
just a random assort, assortment of guys who kind of feel like Steelers as undrafted candidates. All right. Uh, name one guy from my mock draft that you can most see me get getting right. I think it's a really good mock. I really like it overall. I mean, obviously Stevenson because he's you're in still, my mock. You're still going to get paid. You don't have to do all this. <laughs> David, so I, I was tears of weeping, tears of joy at this mock last night that you posted. I said this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, no, I think I think Benton. If 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 if, if they don't go Car Brooks, if they want D line earlier, then they're going to go Keanu Benton. So I think Ben, even at thirty two, I don't think that's that's too high. I think thirty two forty nine are, are two more than reasonable spots for him. So um, I'll say Benton's like the one guy you, you might have pegged correctly. I think when it comes to yours. Uh... I'll, I'll take defensive lineman as well too. I'll go. I'll go. Carl Brooks. You know, if they do bypass that early, uh, and you get into that in into that area, that fourth round, I I, I think that could be the guy. Yeah. So D line trying to find that those types, and obviously Brooks and Benton are different types of dudes, but the interest there is is pretty off the charts on both guys, and and even with Benton going back to the Senior Bowl, how. You know, Benton had told Jonathan Hightrader that Pittsburgh had said to him that, yeah, you're on our radar. And maybe he's on their radar the whole way through. Okay. All, All right. right. So good, good well, mock. That was, that was a good mock by you. I, I I enjoyed it. All right. Thank you. I thought yours was well researched as well. All right. Complete. Uh, you want to talk briefly about your, you have the patience that you're going to make uh, Trevor Kazora a great dad. Oh, my. Can we one, one day. Oh, Forget about this, please. You got the patience of Job, man. You're doing these walk the mock live YouTube sessions and these complete mock drafts. And uh, how much did the uh, Aaron uh, or not? Uh, what was the trade? Yeah, it was the uh, Rogers trade. Okay, the Rogers trade. I mean, you know, it was coming. It just hadn't happened yet. Uh, how much did that throw you off? How, how, how many changes did you have to make? make it wasn't. Well, I was going to pick like 211 at that point. So I was kind of mad. I had to make a couple. Uh, I forgot. I forgot a player. I forgot Zach Harrison. I was going back through my mock, rechecking to make sure, like I had all the names, and I'm okay. Zach Harrison's not there, and so that caused a lot of issues. So, um, but anyway, yeah, it took a, a couple days to do. So I, I, I don't know really what there is to talk about with my full seven round complete NFL mock draft, whatever it's worth. I had Pittsburgh taking Joey Porter Jr. at 17. Probably should have put Deontay Banks there, who I have at 18 to Detroit. But um, just kind of a, a thing I've been doing for a decade now, and it's helps me learn about these players a bit more. And, um, you know, I think his edge class does have some, some depth to it, but trying to find those names for Pittsburgh can be difficult. So I don't know. That was just my, my long winded exercise uh, for the year. God bless you, man. Cause there's no way, <laughs> 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 no way I could do it. it. Not only is there no way I could do it. There's no way I could even uh, come close to, 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 to putting in the effort that you put into this. So good job on that. There's never really not a lot to talk about I me mean, other than just saying, you know, who, who the Steelers picks were and people can find that by just going to SteelersDepot.com. All right, Dave, let's do our overview, overview of the defensive class. We talked about the offensive class for 2023 on Monday's show. So we can go through the defense and just kind of give our final thoughts there um, in terms of players we like, strengths of classes, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll start here with the defensive line class. And I mean, it's not deep. There's some names there. Pittsburgh's had interest in basically all the top names. So it's a question of, you know, what body type they're looking for, what kind of role are they looking for? Is it more of a plugger like a Mazzy Smith? Do they want more of that, you know, Brian Brzee, you know, Carl Brooks type of guy that can hopefully get after the quarterback? So really interesting to see what direction this team goes. Yeah, once again, I think it goes back. Uh, and, and I think when you look specifically at what the Steelers look for, once again, we've had this conversation. There's just a, not a lot of uh, 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 of those guys in there. Now, uh, Siaka Ika out of Baylor is a very talented guy, going to probably come off the board uh, early. Uh, you know, it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see what kind of fall if it, I've seen some. I've seen some mocks out there with Brzee at to, to the Jaguars, I think in the mm-hmm. later in the first round, 24. Yeah. Uh, I think that makes a little bit of sense within there. Uh, Mazzy Smith's a very, very interesting uh, conversation to have. I think comes off the board in, 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 in the second round there, Javon Dexter, who uh, was some of the first film tape that I turned on. 
and then you hear that he's going to come to the Steelers and he doesn't, that that uh, Adebowore is another guy. Man, you watch that senior bowl stuff, uh, that, that tape on him. You go back and watch what, how is the team going to utilize him? Six foot one and a half, uh, five eights at 282, but makes plays and has athleticism off the charts. He, he's in that other, he's in that same category with a Kalijah Kansi. Uh, as well, a uh, guy that you were real hot on or, or, or paid a lot of attention to, Zach Pickens, uh, out of South, South Carolina. Uh, I think he's going to hear his name called in the first three rounds or so. Uh, Colby Wooden is a guy I think high, our own Jonathan Hightritter was on that, mm-hmm. that, 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 uh, probably more of a 4 3 base in. He's like uh, a Wooden. Liao, like 2.0, yeah. I think is Wooden, yeah. Uh, a couple of guys that, uh, I think our Josh Carney was, uh, uh, talked a little bit about early in the process, uh, that Moro Ojomo out of Texas, uh, is, is, is going to garner, you know, some mid round attention in here. And then, you know, another guy, uh, Byron Young out of Alabama there. So overall, it's just a lot of these guys get held up by their, their, their flat out measurables. And, and where they would fit, uh, especially when it comes to the Jacqueline Roy is another guy that I don't think we've talked to hardly any about throughout this process out of, out, out of LSU there. So Coburn, I think, is another guy out mm-hmm. of Texas that uh, uh, that that the big, big old nose throwback nose tackle uh, that's going to be interesting to watch as well, too, there. So I, you know, I think it comes down to what what teams are looking for specifically when it comes to a lot of these guys, because it is kind of a hodgepodge of measurables here. Yeah. There's a lot of guys in this class, this D line class. I like, I don't know if there's a ton that I love. There's a couple, right. obviously Benton being one of those dudes, those guys with traits and tools and Brzee and Dexter, but are kind of projections. You're not quite sure what their fit is and you know, where their ceiling is at. And, and really more importantly, can they, can they achieve that? But yeah, you got your interior guys. You know, Mazzy Smith is is strong and stout and, you know, apparently an athletic freak. I don't know if I necessarily see that on tape all the time. You know, Ika's a big nose tackle, Coburn. Broderick Martin, a sleeper in this class. Um, length, good feet, light feet. I think he's got a little pass rush juice out of, out of your base personnel. Um, then, you know, your Brzee, Dexter, Pickens. I can't believe Pittsburgh did not have more interest in Zach Pickens. I know the production really was not there, but he just checks those boxes from a you know, that's like a guy that checks every single box in your height, weight, and length category. Uh, uh, Carl Brooks, we've talked about him. Kobe Turner, Richmond transfer to Wake Forest. He's got a ton of production. I think Tom Mead likes some guys like Cameron Young from Mississippi State, Corey Durden from NC State. So some, you know, later round guys to to consider. I was watching um, Keon White last night. Have you watched? Did you end up going through um, Keon White? I think we talked about that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I was not impressed. I think in Pittsburgh, I think. He's long, he's lean, he plays high, not going to be stout against the run. Like, he's athletic, he's really athletic, but I think he's just not somebody that's going to have the anchor uh, to play in Pittsburgh. And, you know, throughout this process, and, and that's kind of what 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 my, my takeaway was with him, uh, he's been ranked, a lot of people still, you know, I think have him going in the first round, you know, and, and he's even one that's been invited, right? To, yeah, uh, he'll be at the draft. At, at the draft, too. I, I just, I don't see it. I'm just not seeing it, you know? I mean, I, I thought with the measurables, because dude, 6'5", 285, 34 in jarms, that they would, he's got, he can add weight. It's just, it, it's a total projection there. And yeah, he just played on the edge a lot. And I was watching him against Old Miss and Nick Broker, the left guard, just washing him, just play after play, run after run. And just somebody that I don't think is going to be that great. I think he might be more of that 4-3 end, but yeah, I just, I didn't see it there in Pittsburgh. Okay. All right, so that is the defensive line room. We'll go now to the edge class. It, it's a good edge class overall. There, there's certainly some depth, some names there. Again, I'm trying to find those guys that I really am impressed by. I've had maybe some struggles with. I put on the Van Ness tape some more last night, and I can see that. I mean, he's got heavy hands. He's played up and down. He's got a hot motor. He finishes. Um, he's athletic. He can move in space, and I do like the the heavy hands in which he plays. He had some... His tape felt a little hot and cold, though. Watch him against Ohio State, Paris Johnson, Day One Jones. Some good reps and some, some kind of ugly reps as well. So um, if you want to talk about sleepers at 17, I suppose Van Ness is one. And I, I can see the allure in his game more than I can with a key on white. And once again, you know, uh, just 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 the, the weird fit overall. 
Yeah, just because he's a bit lighter. I mean, he can probably add to that, you know, add weight and, and bulk up. Um, he's got a hell of a bull rush, man. Yeah, the hand. I think he's got leverage and he's got a lot of pop in those hands. So, you know, I, I get it. I, I, I get the idea that I get why they went to Iowa. Right. Uh, what are, what are other thoughts on, on, on? Let me pull up my list here real quick. Yeah, obviously you guys know I love Derek Call. You know, round two. I don't think he's ever going to be like a super high end, you know, star pass <laughs> rusher, but but like a a guy that can, you know, get six to ten sacks a season and you know be a steady steady guy against the run. So that's a guy that I've always been impressed by. I thought he had a great senior bowl week. Obviously, I, I probably no argument. Will Anderson, top of this class, uh, I think. And then you get into the Tyree Wilson should come off in the first round early. Nolan Smith's an inter- interesting conversation. I think Jeremy Fowler even has something out there now that says some, something to the aspect of if, he, if he's there at 17 or whatnot. It just the, the edge tape's great, man. It's just. You know, can, can he do that at the NFL level at that size, or will he have to move off the ball? You know, sure. It's yeah, there's a bit of a projection there, and is it the most immediate need for this team? Um, but if they really love him as an off-ball guy with a hyper athleticism, um, you know, I, I've I've always been the supporter of drafting that position. I think they've had much more success drafting than they've had trying to plug some of these veteran guys in there and hoping it works that way because it has not worked. I think Miles Murphy could go. He uh, is scheme versatile. Uh, I can I can see him <laughs> get into his tape. I can see him ended up in Baltimore somehow. Him there or New England for some reason. I I, I come away thinking that that he's a fit there. Felix uh, Anaduke Uzama, uh, a guy that I I I, I study quite a bit. Uh, Tyler Wise as well too. I just I just wish he would have played on his feet more. Uh, but uh, there's a lot to like there. Will McDonald, uh, uh, nice edge rusher there out of Iowa State, going to come off the board early. We talked about Keon White already. Derek Hall's a guy that we both kind of wondered why the Steelers uh, didn't ha- didn't show mo- more visible interest uh, there. Uh, Fos- Foskey out of Notre Dame. I think Ross Co- uh, Co- um, uh, McC- uh, uh, McCorkle yeah. was uh, uh, real high on him. Uh, ahead of the uh, that he was real interested to watch him ahead of the senior bowl there. Yaya Diaby is a guy that obviously we think could fit the Cedar system. Uh, Zach Harrison, a little bit of one of those kind of those bigger body uh, guys. Uh, obviously, Tuli was in my mock draft. We talked about Isaiah McGuire, I think, could could wind up being a mid round steal for a team. Yeah, McGuire's got size. He's got some power. He can bend through contact. You know, decent production overall. He's been on my radar for a little bit. Zach Harrison's a guy with tools and traits. Really long, 36-plus inch arms. Had a great uh, closeout game against Jalen Duncan in Maryland to to beat the Terps. But the production overall, it's lacking. And you, you kind of wonder why uh, there. I'm with you on Miles Murphy in my seven-round mock. I put Miles Murphy to Baltimore. He was like a Raven. Yeah. Like that, that heavy-handed, that big-edged, uh, Pernell McPhee, you know, type of dude. Uh, that they really gravitate towards. So, you know, BJ Ojolari's gained some steam in this process. Byron Young tested well, but he's an older really guy. Really like By- Byron Young's tape's great as an edge. Really okay. is. The age is just a concern. Dude's 25, and you kind of, well, was his production good in college, or was it kind of mediocre? Do you know uh, what? Um... I, I can't remember the stats right off the top of my head. Plus, he comes in under 6'3", and that, that, that slides him down. But, I mean, for, yeah. for, for an undersized guy, he can really turn the corner. Oh, his numbers last year, 12 tackles for a loss, seven sacks, two years of play with Tennessee. That's decent production right. overall. Uh, there's Andre Carter. I'm not a big fan of Carter. I think he's just so got thrown around at the got thrown around at the senior ball, man. Yeah, I ran a four nine. Uh, I just don't see it. He can bend more than most guys at his frame. I just don't see it overall. He's just too thin in the lower half. Nick Hampton from App State's a, a sleeper guy. Bahoko from San Jose State's kind of a, you know, strong type of dude. Uh, Jose Ramirez, DJ Johnson's a sleeper, not gotten a lot of uh, love there. He can be a you know fourth round type of guy. Robert Beal, Pittsburgh, brought in for a visit. Phelps that I mentioned. So, um, I mean, there's some names here for sure. Thomas Incum, I'm a fan of. As a Maldonado's an interesting late round yeah. prospect. Uh, I think out of Pitt, Jose uh, Ramirez could very well end up as a Steelers undrafted free agent if he doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I've talked about Ramirez some, so I'm with you there. And then some small school guys, Andrew Farmer from Lane College. Um, uh, who's the Ferris State kid? Caleb Murphy put up ridiculous numbers. Isaiah Land, who's kind of a tweener, off-ball end type of dude, but you know he had ridiculous production in the SWAC. So 
there's some small school pass rushers to consider later on day three. All right. Uh, Bill is a guy that has, a, I think, some upside to him, you know, late round. Yeah, he's got really long arms. I mean, he's well built. You know, I think the production was coming down a little bit this past year, but it's so hard to compete for great production when you're, you know, all those great Georgia Bulldogs. So, I mean, I, I, I get the class. Will McDonald, I mean, you, did you mention Will McDonald? Like, super yeah. athlete, you know, Pittsburgh at, at that pro day. Um, good he character. Could, he could be a surprise pick, for, you know, or mm-hmm. probably not a huge surprise, but, I mean, he could be a second or third round guy. depends on how far he falls. But with this edge class, I, I kind of envision him coming off in that second round somewhere. I'm with you overall. So, yeah, th- there's talent there. I'm um, just trying to find those best fits for Pittsburgh. It's been a little bit of a challenge for me. So with the uh, more off-ball linebackers, I wonder who that first off-ball linebacker will be. Trent Simpson, Henley, Drew Sanders. Like, you know, who's that Who's that first guy that's going to come off the board? I'm not quite sure on. Yeah, I'm not as well uh, sure on that either. You talk about a guy like Sanders who, who – you know, was at Alabama and, and what was he an edge and then moved up, had to move off the ball. And, mm-hmm. you know, you got a, you got some project projection in there. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about Jack Campbell, uh, day on Henley's, uh, uh, was, was easy to spot at, uh, on the shrine bowl. Uh, I think, uh, 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 oh, what, no, Henley senior was bowl. the senior, senior bowl. bowl. Uh, the other guy that was the Shrine Bowl guy was the Vanderbilt kid. Uh, Anthony Orgy made a lot of plays in the practices there. Uh, he was easy to spot at the Shrine Bowl, and Henley was easy to spot uh, 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 at the Senior Bowl uh, on the Senior Bowl tape there. Yeah, Henley's a former wide receiver who transferred from Nevada to Washington State, and so has that natural kind of thinks like a receiver. Probably the best coverage linebacker in the in this entire class. Now, obviously, he's going to play run defense, a little bit smaller, a little bit lighter, and so that's the uh, the concern there. I've been a big fan of Jack Campbell. I think he's going to be a steal and, and a ten year starter for whoever gets him. So uh, I love Vince William vibes with Ivan Pace out of Cincinnati to some degree there. He might be the best blitzing linebacker in this whole class too. Watch him senior bowl, the one V ones linebacker versus running back, just destroying dudes. So he's short. He's like five ten. He's playing defensive end randomly. like a six sack, six sack game. At one point in his career, he was a, I think Miami, Ohio, Ohio transfer. And so, um, you know, I just don't know what to do with that guy, but yeah, his, his blitz tape's fantastic. He tries to knock everybody's head off when he <laughs> hit, when he hits people. And I think that was evident at, 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 at the senior bowl, Dorian Williams, uh, probably of all these guys, when it comes to uh, middle round fits for the Steelers, uh, Dorian Williams out of Tulane probably is that guy. Yeah, another guy with a strong senior bowl. Obviously, Aaron Curry at that pro day, he tested well. Um, you know, I, I could see that third, fourth round for sure. I think maybe Williams goes more third round than fourth round at this point. Uh, Servacha Dennis from Pitt is a guy that Tyler Wise has been a fan of. Um, he's tough and you know, he plays hard. Uh, scouts say he's all good, you know, off the field. And then later round guys at that linebacker, you know, Carlton Marshall is the guy that's going to be undrafted because he's so short, but just had, you know, crazy, crazy production. How about Ryan Greenhagen from Fordham? Uh, one of those guys that uh, caught my attention had a 31 tackle performance against Nebraska couple of years Damn. ago, Ryan Greenhagen, Hagen. And so I don't know much about his tape. I didn't dive in really beyond that, but he's got, a little bit of size overall. Jeremy other... Banks would be going a lot higher if it wasn't for the off-field stuff. Yeah, his off-field is super messy. Same, but maybe you could say the same about Isaiah Moore from North Carolina State. Like you know, downhill thumper. He's got uh, some pretty heavy uh, stuff in his past that he's got to answer for. And so um, that's a guy that I think would fit well with the Steelers on tape. But the off-field is going to be the concern. Uh, he is the Vontez perfect of this class. Banks, <laughs> that's a great way to put that. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, what else is there? I like he can, Bobby Miller. He can play. He can yeah, play. He's not going to be on Pittsburgh's radar. I don't no. think that with the off-field stuff, just just I can't see that. Aubrey Miller from Jackson State hit power. This dude forces more fumbles than any linebacker I've seen in in quite some time. I know some people like Ben Van Sumeren from Michigan State, former Michigan running back, turn linebacker. He's athletic, crushed his pro day, but super raw. His processing's a mess, and so he's a late-round undrafted guy to me. All right, next. Uh, corners, the cornerback class we've talked about, you know, so much. I don't know how much there really is left to discuss, especially at the top. Who do you think the first corner gets to, uh, co- who do you think the first corner taken will be? Gonzalez, Witherspoon, somebody else? I think it's got to be Gonzalez personally. The buzz is it'll be, it'll be Witherspoon. I don't know where to go. I guess I'm going to just, uh, 
read the tea leaves and the betting odds and say it's going to be Witherspoon. But to me, Christian Gonzalez is the the clear cut number one corner right. in this class. I mean, and then obviously, expect either one of those two to be Steelers, right? No, if Gonzalez somehow becomes a Steeler, there I'll be very happy. Alex, come come Friday, uh, Porter Banks. Uh, what do you do with Emmanuel Forbes? A buck seventy, lanky, productive. I just one hundred seventy pounds just seems like such a yeah. an outlier for me. It is, but he'll he'll go off the board, you know, uh, sooner rather than later. That's for sure. Yeah, probably top 40 pick at worst, potentially even late first round guy. Cam Smith from South Carolina, you know, not really any any much buzz on him. Another kind of lankier type do with some scheme versatility. Uh, Julius Brents, you know, kind of the Tariq Woolen of this class. Ringo. What do you think about Ringo? What are your thoughts on on Keely Ringo? Yeah, I, I'm with you in that category. There's 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 some moments in this tape. There's there's some moments in the tape where, where, where that turn your head. I just just I, I think he's a mess, kind of tech te- technical wise. I think he's all over the place. Yeah, I think he's really tight hit, but uh, he had that great effort play in um, uh, what was it? Uh, one of the big games that he had. I don't know if it was SEC title game or college football playoff, but uh, going I tell down you, he, that for 207 that he for 207, he moves. Yeah, he's good in a line like, and he can hit. And so I get the allure and I think Pittsburgh will really like that guy. So would not be shocked if Keely Ringo's a stealer at 32 or 49 by the time this thing is all said and done. What about KY Blue Kelly coming out of the, uh, the senior ball and the link? And, uh, you know, we haven't talked about him a lot in the process. Didn't uh, probably didn't test all that well. Yeah, had a strong senior bowl week in some of the 1v1s, and he's got the... What is the connection with Tomlin where his coach was coached by Tomlin or something to that effect? Uh, uh, played for Tomlin at Tampa Bay. His coach played for Tomlin at Tampa Bay? No, no, his, his, his dad. His dad, his dad, okay. I wasn't sure of the connection there. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, I, we focus so much on the early round corners, it feels like that's less likely, and you're right, he didn't, didn't test off the charts, but he's got size and some length and um, you know, had a good senior bowl week. What was the connection? I think you're right. I, I was just remember what the connection was with Tomlin and someone being coached. And I think it was his dad. I think oh, his father, Brian, played uh, cornerback at USC and then went on to play uh, uh, Brian Kelly you know, at Tampa Bay. Won, 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 won the Super Bowl in 2023. In, in 2000, what? 2003. 2003. Okay. Where, where Tomlin was a DB's coach. Right. There. Gotcha. So yeah, I mean, th- again, this corner class is so deep. We've talked about that. You know, Darius Rush is one of my dudes. Pittsburgh brought him in for a visit. Corey Trice is long. I think he can go back to safety. Riley. How about Riley Moss? You want one sleeper? We're not talking about much. I- I'll-, I'll say Riley Moss somewhere uh, in this draft. All right. And I know uh, our own Owen Straley has been high on uh, what, who was it, like Kim Keetrell Clark. And yeah. Starling Thomas uh, out of out of UAB is late round uh, guys uh, real high on, uh, on on those guys coming out of the Shrine Bowl. Then you got Garrett Williams coming off the torn ACL. He might be a stash player, but, you know, could be excellent value. Uh, late round guys. How about Jarek Bernard Converse is a guy that's gained buzz. He had a great pro day workout. At Oklahoma State to, you know, to LSU. I really haven't either, but I know he's got some production. He's got size and, and some length. Um, small school guy, big slot, Isaiah Bolden, kick return guy. Again, this cornerback class, Justin Ford, you know, aggressive, um, probably goes to safety, but uh, had some good Montana tape. So all of that is to say this cornerback class, I think it's deep, pretty ridiculous. It's deep. All right, and we'll wrap things up here with the safety class. Not nearly as good or as deep as the cornerback class. Brian Branch, to me, is the number one guy. A little bit of the question on exact position fit, but after Branch, there's a clear tier two. Um, I think Branch is in a camp uh, all of his own. Yeah, I, I got to admit, I didn't spend a whole lot of time uh, on, on the safety class. And and poor, uh, didn't Marte Mapu, uh, isn't he hurt now? Yeah, he tore his pack. I mean, he may right. be more of a linebacker, kind of hybrid. I don't know, like a Kyle Duggar type. He's probably not going to play full-time safety at the NFL level. Uh, Daniel S- Scott uh, tested really, really well. And the Steelers brought him in. You talked about Jamari Connor uh, out of Virginia Tech. Uh, I talked about Anthony Johnson Jr., more of a later round guy in this class. Uh, uh, I guess, who else? Uh, Trey Dean down there in Florida is another late round guy but uh, didn't test all that well. Oh, it's, it's just, it's not, uh, you, you look at guys like uh, Jair Brown, you know, might end up being quote unquote, kind of, 
you know, a steal out of this class. Yeah, he didn't run well either. He ran four sixes at the combine, uh, high four fives at his pro day. But I mean, he's got really good production. He's got you know, one year. I think he led uh, all safeties and in interceptions. Next year, let him uh, all in tackles for loss. And he's got a little bit of thickness and a really you know uh, unstoppable motor. I think Pittsburgh will, will like that. So um, you kind of wonder exactly, you know, does he have the speed to play in space at the next level? But I think Pittsburgh will love the production. And of course, they had Terrell Austin and Grady Brown at that pro day. I did not watch any of Jamie Robinson. Tell me about him out of Florida State. Yeah, I didn't spend much time. He's kind of small. He's a hitter. He's a downhill kind of guy, but a buck 91. Yeah, I don't think the traits were overwhelming. I don't think the testing, I don't think it was, what was he, what was his testing? I don't think it was um, anything to write home about. A four, five, nine, I think. Yeah, 191. Shorter arms. Not, yeah, not loving that. Antonio Johnson to me is an overrated guy. Sidney Brown, I wanted to like him more than I did. Jordan Battles got talent. He's just, has not put it all together. I like Christopher Smith from Georgia. I think he's a, a sleeper. I know he's small, did not test well, but just a baller, just really good tape. Owen Straley is high on him. But yeah, trying to find some safety names that I like. You know, Brandon Hill, not a big fan of Brandon Joseph, not a big fan of. Same with Ronnie Hickman. It is just not a good safety class. I think Connor and Johnson are some guys to look at on day three of the draft. All right. And let's see what else. Uh, that's probably about it. Specialists. This team probably they'll bring in a kicker. I think BT Potter from Clemson's a name to a uh, the circle there. All right, undrafted guy. Yeah, something like that is kind of my my read of it. So, all right, Dave, we're winding down. Any final thoughts here? The draft is now just over twenty four hours away, and all that speculation will soon be put to bed. I think uh, the the obviously the things to watch is the quarterbacks coming off the board early, and how many actually go in the first round this year. Uh, there, there will obviously going to be a few trades in the first round. That'll be interesting to watch. Uh, the Steelers indeed, I, as I stated at, at near the top of the show here, uh, I wouldn't have thought I would have been in this place uh, at the start of this process, but I could see the Steelers actually moving up a couple of spots or you know, as high as even nine potentially to go get a tackle. Uh, coming out at press conference the other day, uh, going to be a long wait overnight uh, Thursday night to Friday to see if the Steelers climb out of that 32 spot, which I think there is a high probability of that happening. I would expect through some sort of process that this team ends up with a fifth or sixth round draft pick somehow uh, through the process. You know, uh, Kevin Dotson, as I've stated, is a name to watch throughout all this, I think, as potentially maybe getting moved. Uh, overall, but I think you will see the Steelers move not only once in this draft, but possibly even twice. Yeah, those are all the questions I was going to ask you about. Will they trade up? Will they move 32? Will they get a fifth, sixth round pick? And you kind of answered them all for me. So, uh, you know, I don't have a whole lot more to add. I, I, I'm with you. I think that they will somehow, some way get a fifth or sixth round pick. I just don't think Omar Khan's going to sit there and watch 130 players pass him by. When he's think, talked about how deep this class, you know, deep sure. this draft is, now that obviously that could be speak, but uh, it's such a long wait, you know. Uh, I, it, it just feels like a fifth or sixth round pick will show up. Oh, probably a fifth round pick or another fourth. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, within that, but it, it does feel like this team's going to move not only once, but possibly even twice. Yeah, I think there will. I think there'll be. I mean, it's a very vague, like general thing to say. I think that there will be one trade. I'd be shocked if Pittsburgh picks were actually what they are right now. I just don't think that's going to happen. And, and what that looks like, you know, is anybody's guess. I think they're going to try to trade that 32nd overall pick. I do think historically it's not a pick that's been traded as much as I think the Steelers stink. And if they're banking on a, a quarterback shopper coming along, I think they're going to be disappointed. I don't think Hendon Hooker gets out of the first round. If he does, then the probability of them trading uh, pick 32 top of the second round skyrocket. So, you know, I think for Pittsburgh, while quarterback talk early, is not uh, relevant to them taking a quarterback. I think it's really relevant in, in other ways in the sense of where do the top quarterbacks go? Does that push names down and where does Hendon Hooker go? And how does that impact Pittsburgh's chances of moving that 32nd overall pick? What is one guy the Steelers come out of the first round with that would be you know, we've talked about, you know, even if they traded up to get Paris Johnson or, or whatever happens with Broderick, you know, uh, 
the the three tackles aside in in Wright, Johnson, and Jones, and cornerbacks in Banks, Porter, Jr., and let's throw in just for giggles Brian Brzee, the defensive tackle out of out of Clemson, as a possibility. Outside of that scope of names, who's somebody that could show up? That oh wow. And what do you mean by oh wow? In I mean, terms of like should, surprise or me yeah, loving yeah. It or? Outside of those names, who who who's the next most likeliest guy to be the Steelers' first round pick? And I know I mean, that's it's a, it's a fairly large. We've covered a very fairly large gamut of players there, but right. So you're asking like, who are the surprises that may be like shock you at, at, at 17? Yeah. Not not sure, maybe not shock you, but like the guys we're not we're not giving much uh, attention to. I mean, it's it's Lucas Van Ness from Iowa. I can I can buy that. I mean, if you want to believe the Nolan Smith thing, I mean, I, I, he checks the boxes and he's a super athlete. And so I guess you could, you know, put him in there. Brian Branch, maybe as well. I think, I think it's uh, pretty less likely. But if the board breaks a certain way, I mean, just to throw that name in there. So I guess it'd be like any wide receivers. I, I mean, who and, and, and neither one of us took a wide receiver, did we? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, that's probably the first time that's happened in the entire uh, history of the site. I would have to guess. Um, I mean, you can mention his A flowers. I mean, Addison to me is way too high for 17. I mean, they just trade for Allen Robinson. I don't know if they're going to do that with the intent of drafting a receiver at 17. I know Robinson is, is probably only going to be a one year guy. I just don't see that being the move um, based on the pre draft guys they brought in that were all mid round you know, type of candidates. So uh, you can't say no to anything. But if a Jackson Smith and Jigba were to fall, then I guess that gets thrown into into the mix has this been the most uh has this been the hardest in a while or do we say that every year to kind of to me no I mean, we say that maybe to some extent but i think last year was easier we, we knew because we knew quarterback was going to be like the pick we just didn't know which quarterback we didn't know how that board was going to fall and no one could really predict what ultimately happened on draft day 2021 was a layup with Najee harris i mean it was every mock draft put that in there so that was just not not a discussion to me this is the hardest since 19 and we knew they loved Devin Bush in 19. It just was a question of would they move up? And my concern was if they don't go up, who do they get? I was really unsure of. So um, we don't even have that guy that like we know that they love this year. It's not it's not that clear the way that it was in 2019. So, yeah, to me, this is as difficult to predict in in, in quite some time. I feel like I've been all over the map with with range from senior bowl on here to to how I think this thing might play out. I'm with you. I mean, I looked at my first mock draft uh, that I did, you know, way back, I think early March, and it's not like too different. My first mock had Joey Porter Jr. And so I'm kind of ending, you know, in the not, not with Porter, but like, I think, is it fair to say, let me ask you this way. What are the, what percentage odds that the first pick at 17 will be either a corner or a tackle? Is it like 75% chance it's going to be one of those? I feel it's very positions? high. I feel very it's high. very, very, very high. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm with you, but. But then it gets into the discussion I'd say eighty five percent. I mean, that's where I'm at on this thing ending. It just becomes a matter of okay, who who falls? Do you want right. to play the waiting game, or do you go up there and make that move? Um, and I think Khan is going to look to be aggressive. Now, does a deal materialize? You, you don't have complete control of that, but I think Khan will look to move up to go get a, a guy like Broderick Jones. All right. Uh, shall we get to some emails? Yeah, let's get the emails and close out today's show. All right, Deshaun Campbell writes in one night away from draft night, so I'll ask you guys this. Did the Steelers fail Kendrick Green? Reading what Pouncey had to say about how he was brought into a bad situation with a lot of pressure of him starting off with giving him uh, number 53. He says, in my opinion, Steelers never gave him time to develop into the pros. He started his career at a new position at the highest level of football. Second year, he goes back to guard, but also has a new offensive line coach, blah, blah, blah. Now his play didn't help him at uh, all that, but it was, was he ever really given a fair shot? Seems it's not just a Kendrick green thing because all, all, all other offensive linemen who were there before Meyer uh, are all looking to get replaced. Uh, I mean, it's a fair question there, but it, 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 it seemed out of character from the time he was selected. Really. It, it didn't seem, it seemed like they, they set him up to fail the moment they picked him. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame. I mean, obviously, you know, he struggled. He's not played well, but I think Pittsburgh had a really poor and misevaluation on what Kendrick Green 
was supposed to be and could be. I just go back. I, I cannot. I will never be able to uh, unthink about that that quote that Mike Tomlin had about why they drafted Kendrick Green, saying that they wanted a day one ready center when Kendrick Green was an underclassman uh, that hadn't really played much center before. And he was like the opposite of day one ready. He was a guy that needed some time. So I think Pittsburgh just totally botched the evaluation there. And honestly, maybe one reason why Adrian Clem was kind of showing the door, because I think that was a Clem driven pick and uh, one that was totally wrong. And look, they uh, and did they fail him by putting him in there right away and then just sticking with him as as bad as the tape was instead of getting him out of there earlier than, you know, it's almost like they said, we're going to make this work, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, their other options, I guess, are pretty limited. And so they just kind of, you know, they wanted to stand by their guy and yeah, just, just obviously a, a, a complete. Mess. I'll tell you this Deshaun. Uh, I, I didn't see the Kendrick green pick coming. Yeah. I, I, I should have had, I been able to correctly identify Clem being at that pro day and I screwed that up. So that was, that was kind of on me for not doing a good job there. Um, but you know, in hindsight, it made sense because Clem was there. Matthew Toretta writes in, could you see Nolan Smith being viewed as a Ryan Shazier type? Uh, by the Steelers. He says, Jeremy Fowler's report about him not getting past the Steelers at 17 has me thinking that. He says, Fowler, for the most part, seems accurate with his reporting, so I think Smith could be true dark horse candidate at 17. Curious to your thoughts on on this. Look, we talked about you know uh, uh, the Fowler report a little bit earlier in the show here. Uh, he checks a lot of boxes. It, it's just it's such a hard evaluation when you're talking about a guy that's played on the edge was a great pass rusher on the edge. Ryan Shazier back back in his college tape, though he moved all over, and that did make him a, a little bit of a harder evaluation back back there. Then, but at least you had a little bit more stuff with him off the ball, if I remember, uh, a lot more stuff with him off the ball. Uh, I mean, he's athletic as all get out. It, it, it does feel though that if you, you know, what does that process look like if you draft him in the first round? And your intention is to make him a true inside linebacker in the Steelers system. It's going to take time. It will. And, you know, how well will he play the run and get downhill and some of those things you kind of wonder about? Um, I, I get it. I mean, I get the question. I get the idea behind a Nolan Smith. It's just not my expectation right now. Right. Uh, let's see. Flaw, uh, Arthur Elliott, Dave and Alex first love the show. Uh, really enjoying the two hour podcast last couple shows, two questions. He says, I'm curious if you think the my, minority hire, hiring initiative, the Rooney role has a major flaw in it, that it doesn't offer the incentives for the in-house hires. For example, the Niners just received a bunch of comp, uh, compensatory picks, but the students who hire con from within uh, get nothing. Uh, I, I, I see where you're going there. Look, I, I uh, the whole Rooney role is, is not, has not turned out the way he initially wanted it to be. I don't think plain and simple. Sure. I would say it hasn't had the results that, uh, that rule was intending to have. And I guess, it, it, he, I guess he makes a point there. Should there be some sort of for them promote promoting a guy like Khan or something like that, you know, should there be more incentives even for in-house guys? I, I, I get the argument. I understand it. You just worry about abuse of the rule and loopholes and teams gaming the system by, okay, let's just go promote a bunch of, you know, people in, in minority roles to get draft picks as opposed to, because if it's an out of house hire, the team that, that's doing the hiring does not actually, you know, get the pick. It's a team that's losing that gets the pick, which A helps them because they just lost, you know, probably a key personnel member. So I just worry about the in house thing that, you know, did they really, did they really hire this guy because they, they wanted to hire this guy. They felt like he was the right guy or did they hire him because they wanted the extra comp picks? Like that would be the concern with the in-house, uh, you know, compensation argument. And, and I can buy that enough to, to probably, you know, understand to not uh, make that a, a modification to the rule. He also wants to know, are we sleeping on Jack Campbell as a possible steer? He says, Tom and Kamala read his pro day and it's a need in his opinion. I mean, I'm not sleeping on the name. I love the name. I love Jack Campbell. I love him to, to become a Steeler. Uh, have I have I talked about it much in terms of it, you know, being realistic? A little bit, maybe not a lot. And so it's probably a fair, you know, point. We could talk about a hundred guys that may become Steelers, right. and you know, probably not not cover all of our bases. So you, you can't discount it. 
I just but look at, you know, they signed Holcomb, they signed Roberts, they, you know, they looked at some more mid-round linebackers when it comes to where Aaron Curry went, which kind of tells me they might be looking more mid-rounds than, than early rounds. Uh, let's see. Lenny Marstakowski writes in, hey, wow, Dave, I know you only did one this year, but definitely saved the best mock draft for last. That's by far the best. Oh, this scares me. That's by far the best draft I've seen to cover all of our needs on the roster. Well, <laughs> there goes that. Uh, <laughs> great job. I only have one question today, and that is, do you guys feel that Kenny Pickett might feel a little too much pressure this year? I think this roster is a little bit better shape than we all expected to be uh, year this year to the expected and the expectations might be higher than we thought. Uh, look, I'll, I'll tell you this. I don't know how many of you have watched the pivot interview with Kenny Pickett uh, from with, with Ryan Clark and company that, that surfaced yesterday. We wrote a ton about it and all like that. And it, there's nothing shocking, overly shocking in it other than the hand split thing, I think. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, and it just goes to show you how crazy the draft process can be for the, for these kids and all like that. Uh, the guy, hey, you cannot watch that thing and not smile just the way he he talks like a fourth year quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, he was an older guy. He was, what, like 24 years old coming out and five-year guy at Pitt. I mean, the maturity, the leadership, like that stuff to me, always been off the charts, never going to be a question, never going to be an issue. And never was and never was never a was. question. Right. A uh, 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 question here. If you're grading quarterbacks and putting a grade on them as far as as far as where they're at in certain areas of, of their game on the field and off the field, and off, I mean, he uh, – I'm not aware. I'm not worried – I guess where I'm getting with this is I'm not worried about Kenny Pickett as far as where expectations might be for him and him handling the mental aspect of that and, 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 and everything associated. The proof will be on in the pudding with, with the play on the field. I'm not worried about him and expectations and him handling those expectations of being the next quarterback in Pittsburgh, got it, all that stuff. I'm not, I'm not worried about him from any mental aspect of, 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 of anything. I agree. I guess you could look at the question and say, are we, are we expecting too much out of Kenny Pickett for him to be like, you know, we expect him to take a jump in year two, but is he going to, he's probably not going to become like a top five quarterback next year. And maybe their expectation is a bit too high for him and for this offense to radically turn things around when it may not be that quick of a progression. Maybe that's the angle to to look at it because I agree, you know, mentally, I think he's as, as mentally tough as, as any quarterback, his age and, and his position as you're going to find. I mean, I, I mean, th this guy, if you draw him up off the field, I mean, he, he's it for sure. <laughs> you know, so I, I, you know, the core of the question, I'm not worried about the expectations and him hand, handling them, that aspect that would just, and I think they're going to try to set him up in every way to be able to run the football and, and, and make this second year easier on him. You know, Same. I agree. Uh, Dan Devlin writes in, good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for your wonderful draft co coverage as well as your round tables, which have been terrific to listen to. Look, we, I, I can't state this enough, man. We have, we have such a great team just uh, on the site and, and they did such a great, fantastic job and getting on the round tables with us. I've learned a ton from them. He says, after listening to coach T's comments, I'm convinced the Steelers will trade down from 17 32 or both and end up with additional second round picks. Who is a prospect you could see realistically sitting mid to late second round that you think the Steelers should grab immediately? He says maybe Brzee, uh, Brents, uh, he says Campbell, Addison. I, I, I would go back to if they traded down from 32 a little bit later, a guy they would grab immediately. I, I, I think Keanu Benton. Yeah, I think so, too. I mean, I don't think Brzee's going to last that long. I mean, it could be any of those corners. You know, Darius Rush, if he's sitting there, if you have not taken a corner, uh, I I'm for that all day. I don't know if I have one particular name. Um, you know, Derek Hall, personally, I would I would love to for him to become a Steeler. So I guess kind of the names I've talked about before. Uh, Ryan Roberts writes in, Dwayne Haskins died tragically on April 9th, 2022. RIP to him. And I was curious, do you think the Steelers would would have drafted Kenny Pickett just three weeks later if Haskins was still alive. First and foremost, I think yes, 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 they would have. And uh, that you know, 
Uh, I, I just think that, I mean, Haskins was, was going to be battling for a roster spot. I, I think, I don't think ha- what happened to Haskins uh, impacted them taking picket. No, it didn't at all. Uh, it had, had, had Haskins still been alive, they probably would not have drafted Crystal Odokin in the seventh right. round. They wouldn't have needed the, uh, the extra quarterback there, but uh, no, as, as tragic as that was, it did not impact their draft plans or strategy, you know, one bit. He says, I wonder if Haskins was still an option. Would they have made a different decision? He says, my gut says no, but I asked several of my Steeler buddies and their takes were surprisingly mixed uh, on that. Thanks as always for supplying the best uh, coverage and content of my beloved Steelers. Can't wait for the day we hear about the birth of Trevor Kazora. I can't wait. Uh, you know, mm. Uh, Never Bryce, gonna forget that. Bryce writes in, Hey guys, it's Bryce. Thanks for the great coverage. Can't believe it's finally here. So blow, blow is my only mock draft I'm submitting courtesy of the analytics draft simulator on ESPN. We'd love to get your thoughts. He has Broderick Jones, Azuma, Tyreek Stevens. He's got a couple of names. Uh, I've got in here. Uh, he's got Tillman, the wide receiver at 80 to uh, Tavius Robinson, outside linebacker at 120. D Winters, inside linebacker and MJ Anderson, defensive end. Uh, he says also have a little bit of a fun question. Uh, curious to hear your thoughts. If Mike Tomlin just suddenly decided he wanted to retire, which current head coach minus Belichick and Andy Reid would you most want to take over and coach the Steelers? Oh Lord, we got a hypothetical in here on Mike Tomlin on mm-hmm. something that's not going going to happen here. Uh, I I haven't given it much thought. If so, if, if Tomlin suddenly decided to retire, which current head coach minus Belichick or Andy Reid would you most want to take over as a head coach? Let me get us William and Mary teammate, Sean McDermott. Maybe okay. I'd go with him. I, I don't I, I'm, I have not spent any time on on this, obviously, but I've always res- had a lot of respect for Sean McDermott, the way that you know he handled the the, the Mar Hamlin situation, the way he just handles his players. Um a building that thing in Buffalo has done a great job. So I mean I, I don't know, but you know, I'll go McDermott to answer the I, question. All right. Uh, mock, I, yeah, nice, nice mock. Todd, uh, Todd Bowles comes to mind. I, I like Todd Bowles. I really do. I, you know, okay. pro- probably not all that great of a head coach, but I mean, I, I, I haven't given much thought to that, Bryce, to be honest with you. Uh, Craig Sampson, Dave and Alex, kudos to the hard work. Best site. Uh, how did, how did the, how did everyone, including the experts, misevaluate the quarterbacks from last year? They thought the Steelers would trade up for Malik Willis. He ended up going in the third round. On the contrary, I know you haven't studied the quarterbacks this year, uh, that much, but this class really so much better than, but is this, 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 this class really so much better than than last year's class. I feel like it's hype more than talent. None of the guys last year even played except Kenny Pickett. So it's hard to evaluate them. People raved, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I remember the Jets tanked for Sam Darnold. People raved about uh, Johnny Manziel and Josh Rosen. It's fascinating how evaluators who are experienced in doing this for years bust on the quarterback so many times. I, I think your end statement there kind of sums it up how if I even even people that are paid that that's their job uh doing this for years and and bust on on the quarterback look you 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 can get caught up in the fact that like last year thinking man surely three or four quarterbacks are going to go in the first round every year and and who are those guys and do they get overdrafted and um you know I I think I'm guilty of that last year of thinking well surely this you know, surely three or four of these guys are going to go in the first round and they obviously didn't. And you got talk now, Malik Willis, maybe already being done in, 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 in Tennessee, uh, as an outsider, you don't know what goes on in these college campuses and how much, how much these guys can process and, and, how much exactly these offenses are, are tailored around certain aspects and uh, of, of these guys. And, you know, Malik Willis is probably a great example of that what Malik Willis did off platform was totally phenomenal. But I think we're, we're finding out that a, a guy just can't live off of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know, uh, at some point you got to stand in the pocket and, 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 and make plays. And then you have the whole Matt Corral thing and RPO heavy stuff. And, you know, look, we're going to continue to make mistakes on this as, as our NFL people. And if it was a science, it, it, it you know, it would be a science. I, I don't, I don't, I mean, look, we were, we were wrong about this class. 
Yeah. Last, last I, year. Sure. I was definitely wrong. I think it was so un- we're just so accustomed to oh, top quarterbacks. They go first round and right. you know, some classes are a bit stronger than others, but like, you know, it's never, you, you never see the the drop that you saw last year. So that was really like new for me, basically in my lifetime, uh, pretty darn close to it at least. So yeah, maybe I got too swept up in some of the traits and some of the potential and, and a little less on some of the nuts and bolts of quarterback play. And obviously we'll see how, you know, their stories are not written yet. I mean, it's not looking great for Malik Willis right now, but who the heck knows? We we knew that he needed time. We knew, like, as a rookie, he was not ready to play. So right. his struggles last year was was no shock to to anyone, even his biggest supporters. And we'll see what, what uh, Desmond Ritter does. And Washington seems super high on Sam Howell. And, you know, so, you know, we're only one year into this thing. But, yeah, it's a good learning experience. And you try to figure out what you did wrong, how you can improve upon it for next time. And hopefully for Pittsburgh, we're not talking about first-round quarterbacks for – for quite some time. So um, hopefully they got their guy. Uh, I'll take one last one to run along here. Larissa writes in great analysis and coverage. Uh, what is the stance that the Steelers have about low balling undrafted free agents? Uh, it's pocket change for the Steelers. It would allow them to not spend a pick on a quarterback or punters in the seventh round and get those guys after the draft, then trade our two seventh round picks to move it up to, to the six or something to, 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 to that version. Look, Larissa, uh, you, you're preaching to the choir here, especially with uh, pastor, Pastor Kazora, uh, <laughs> uh, when 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 when, or when it comes to this here, uh, here's something that important to remember: there is all teams have a limit, a rookie, uh, a rookie undrafted kind of reservation pool, where whether you sign one undrafted free agent or you sign twenty of them, uh, you cannot exceed that amount in signing bonus money. Okay, now. Where the differences come in is teams guarantee certain amounts, if not the full amount, sometimes of their first year base salary there. That's where that's where you get into the the buying process more of these undrafted free agents. So the question then becomes, why don't the Steelers do more in maybe partially guaranteeing some of this first year base salary? to maybe get a higher quality one or two of these guys in the door. Right. That's the loophole you can call. It. There's a cap on signing bonus. There's no cap on, you know, base salary, partial guarantees. And I believe you wrote the study the other day. I think Pittsburgh's one of only four teams to basically not do the partial base salary guarantees. I think it's five bonus or five. Okay. Four or yeah. five My extreme minority uh, either way. And why does Pittsburgh approach that? My guess is they don't want to take on the risk of kind of accumulating some dead money with some undrafted guys if they don't make it. I guess is probably their rationale behind it, even if it is going to be a small amount of money. If you give that to two or three players, that that kind of adds up, you know, half million dollars or so. So maybe that's their their rationale. But I think it certainly puts them at a very competitive disadvantage. Right now, look, they still got Jalen Jalen Warren out of this last year, right? You know? Yeah, but over the last like five, six years, their undrafted classes have not been good. Like Warren was a gem and BJ Finney was one years and years ago. But like generally speaking, it's not as strong as it used to be. I think last year, what was the number? The rookie reservation was 167, 167. 168,000. They spent like 110 or 100. Right. Why not spend the max? At least spend the max. If you're not going to do the base salaries, at least, you know, max out that signing bonus. Yeah. That, that's a good point as well, too. Why not uh, give a couple of guys some, why not make all of them higher priority free agents, you know, and right. at least, I mean, and at least spend up to the max that you can spend in the signing bonus category, which they never do. Right. They never do that. It's not even just the one off thing. Like Jalen Warren literally, said he came to Pittsburgh, not because of opportunity, but because they offered him the most amount of money, a $12,000 signing bonus. So money talks. I mean, obviously these guys, you know, look at fit and roster construction, but money talks as well. So if you're, if you're not going to do the partial base salary guarantee, then at, at least max out uh, the signing bonus. Um, I, do you think that changes this year? I'm, I'm going to be watching for that as closely as anything sure. when it comes to the draft. I don't I really think it will. <laughs> I don't think it will either. I'm hoping that it will, but I, I don't think it will, but I'm going to be watching that like super intently even as the draft is ending. I, I, I'm i just wondering if they'll even hit 125,000 in signing bonus money. You know what the max is this year? Cause that, it's I like, that changes. I don't, I, the official, I haven't seen the official number, but I've, I've heard it speculated that it'll be like 180,000 around in there. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, you could, you know, and I tell a- you, even spending that full one hundred eighty thousand would be monumental uh, move in there from from them. I'm betting Pittsburgh's reason why they don't do that is they don't want to set precedent. They give a guy a big $50,000 signing bonus, you know, one year, then next year that same agent's going to say, well, I want 50 K too for my client. So that's probably why they don't do that stuff. Um, but I think overall it still makes them have far worse. They've had some really ugly undrafted classes in recent years that have really been, been a problem. It is a fun process right after the draft ends tracking that though. <laughs> Fun is a word for it. Chaos is another word for it. Like it's 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 pretty insane. But it, yeah, it is it it is kind of exhilarating. Uh the second uh, part of this question, and it's a great one from Larissa. I don't understand how rankings change. I took a screenshot, see below, of rankings uh, from September 2022, and guys like Christian Gonzalez were not even listed in the top 20 uh, cornerback list, and now he's the first cornerback. What changed? The tape is the tape, and what changed from their tape to now? How how can a combine or pro day change if the tape is solid? That's been my all, one of my biggest argument is how how does stock change? Uh, from a combine or a pro day uh, a change if the tape is solid. Uh, goes on to say, and, and the same thing with Darnell Wright, not even on the list. How is that possible? These are lists, and, and there's some screenshots in here that are fantastic. These are from September 22nd, 2022. So the college season was still going on, but uh, but still changes are crazy. Thanks for all, all you do. Uh, people, rankers, finally catch up with the tape. I imagine I I thought about this after seeing the question, Larissa, I imagine this stuff slowly starts with the college scouts and, and goes out to connections in the media or, or CBS or, or Brugler. And it starts going out that way. And it filters on down into, uh, 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 Nagy, at the senior ball. And then these, 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 uh, guys that, that have more time to dedicate to the tape during the off season, start digging into the tape and that shapes opinions and, and all like that. I would imagine whoever is that first scout that people have a connection to that says, look, this is the way you should be looking at this list. I, I imagine that, is where the first development is. And then obviously you got the underclassmen kids and, mm-hmm. and all like that. So uh, I mainly, I think a lot of this has to do with people getting away from the measurables and finally catching up with the tape. Well, kudos to you, Larissa, for holding on to this question for a while uh, to have that September, like knowledge of, let me take a screenshot then and compare it to, to April. That that's kind of cool. Um, it's, yeah. let, let me read these off real quick uh, yeah. from, from a screenshot here. Uh, this is uh, from college football news.com 2023 NFL draft top prospects. First look offensive tackles. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm guessing this is from September, 2022 Paris Johnson. Okay. Well, that's not bad. Jalen Duncan, Maryland, number two. Peter Skaronsky, three. Daywan Jones, four. Robert Scott Jr., Florida State. Jackson Kirkland, Washington. Tyler Steen, Alabama. Broderick Jones, eight out of Georgia. Zion Nelson out of Miami, ninth. Blake Freeland out of BYU. Logan Brown. Cortland Ford. Wanya Morris. Walker Parks. Carter Warren out of Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I would say a couple things to that. One, there is the whole underclassmen in the sense of a some underclassmen that may not be on the radar as much that emerge, and then underclassmen that return. Like half that list are guys that are not even in this class this year. Um, who was the Florida guy? I think you said Robert something, or what was the uh, one name uh, on there? The Florida State uh, Robert Scott Jr. out of Florida yeah. State. To my knowledge, unless unless he's like an undrafted guy that's totally off the radar, I think he's probably back in school. So. You have, you know, a handful of those guys to return that, that, you know, eliminates them off the top. You do obviously have a full season that happened, you know, Broderick Jones. I'm I'm actually surprised Broderick Jones was even on that list today because he had started like four games at that point in his career. So it's like super, you know, limited information on him until he played, you know, obviously a lot more in 2022. So, um, you know, a year can change a lot. Joe Burrow, you know, a year before he was the first overall pick, no one talked about. So a year changes a lot. Um, I do think it's kind of some group think early on and just kind of some, Best guesses based off of, you know, who was all conference the year before and that kind of stuff. And, you know, the, the closer you get, the, um, the the more clarity that you receive. So I think a year certainly can 
can change a lot. And, you know, people have not really done their homework until you get closer towards the NFL draft. Yeah. Larissa, good screenshots. Great question. Yeah. Really, really cool. So, all right, Dave, thanks. Going to wrap things up. Tell, we'll tell people what to expect this weekend, Alex on the depot. Yeah. I mean, every, everything you can want for in, in NFL draft coverage from obviously who the pick is to, we should have a profile on hopefully almost all, if not all their draft picks. I think we finished at about 270 or so draft profiles. So really great job by the team to, to surpass what our goal was this year. Um, and we have reports on all the pre-draft visitors. So we'll have all those ones knocked off, but yeah, we'll have the, the reaction to the pick. We'll have the press conferences that occur. Um, we'll have, you know, guys to talk about for day two. I mean, podcast Friday. I mean, every, every single angle possible to attack this thing, some film rooms, I'm sure, uh, we'll be covering. Thank you to everybody who's listened throughout this process and, you know, read the site throughout the off season. It's been a fabulous, uh, off season pre-draft process. And, uh, we, we just can't thank readers and listeners a lot enough, nor can we thank our, our amazing crew enough. Uh, just absolutely outstanding. We hope you enjoyed the pre-draft process and the coverage and all like that. We look forward to bringing you now the draft coverage there. So with that, as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show, the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. If you like what we do and want to donate to the cause, SteedersDepot.com, hit the donate button upright, navigation to bar. Also, if you like an ad free version of the site, SteedersDepot.com, hit the ad free button. Alex, it's just, I mean, I've learned so much from you throughout this process as well, too. And I appreciate all the effort that you put into this. And uh, I couldn't ask to do it with a better person uh, throughout all this. So, with Thank that, you, Dave. Uh, As always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.